First up, we have Cat Lateral Damage. Here's the trailer that PlayStation themselves shared on their channel. Who are you fooling? You're no cat. But I just want to cat. Now you can cat. Uh -huh. These are the videos I used to make when I was 17. Look, I'm not gonna pretend that my videos are any kind of professional high art, but I wouldn't expect Sony to be okay with them using this terrible quality smosh sketch as an official business trailer to sell a video game on their official marketplace. I mean, if you're gonna use a bulge effect, at least move the center point to your mouth. Ooh, nice smoke cropping there. I bet that took you at least six weeks. Do you hear something? No, just keep playing. So that was the trailer. I'm sure the game can't be any worse than that, and that is the fastest time I've ever been proven wrong in my life. Cat Lateral Damage is a first person game where you control a cat and be a big smelly ass. You knock things off of shelves and swipe power ups to knock things over easier. And then that's it, yeah, that's it. The idea of being a cat that just breaks everything is a cute one. Fine, sure, what evs, but once that concept's idea loses the charm, the game had better carry the rest of the concept along. But it doesn't. This is a really boring game. You just swipe things off of other things with wonky physics and ugly graphics. And make sure you're quick because you only have 4 minutes and 60 seconds to do it! I heard through the grapevine that this was apparently supposed to be a joke game that wasn't that brilliantly made for the sake of the humour, but come on, blow me a new one. It's still on the store and costs you $9.99, and for an extremely one-track game with one joke, that is not cheap. Sure it has VR functionality which gives you a little more for your money, but just the idea of looking at these other cats in VR makes me throw up out of my nose so I think I'll pass. And then, without any smooth transition whatsoever, here is the greatest box art of all time. I'm serious, this is possibly the best box art I've ever seen in my life. Look at it. Hermione is looking off slightly to the left, Ron is about to kamikaze the side of Hogwarts Castle, and what is Harry doing with his face? Now, this may just be the greatest video game ever created. Wanna know why? Because you start it up, you see all of the splash logos of the companies involved in making it, and then the very first thing you see is Neville Longbottom. Are you ready? So in Harry Potter for the Connect, you get the honor of playing through a few major events of all of the movies in one big story mode. Harry Potter was living with his awful Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon when, on his 11th birthday, his Uncle Vernon sat on him. So we've got our Hogwarts letter ready to go, and we can choose to have it in movie mode, which is addressed to Harry, or custom mode, which is... <laughs> Which is which is addressed to Cadicorous TV, and I'm picking that one based on how great it would be if Hogwarts selected students with their gamer tags. Welcome to Hogwarts! Muffmuncher underscore 69? And because we've chosen custom mode, this also means we get to customize our wizard by taking a photo of ourselves and using that as our avatar. And I ended up with this. Welcome to Hogwarts, where if we don't like your face, we rip it off and stick this one on it. And now we have to get our wand, preferably without breaking anything. Now we need to be sorted into our schoolhouse, and apparently we can shout at the connect in order to influence its decision. Slytherin! 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 Have full puff! Well now I'm only left with one question. Did my parents send me off to Hogwarts because I'm magical, or because they didn't want to look at my face anymore? Let's get on with the school year then, I can't wait to see what adventures we get up to. Um, potions class, perfect. You will attempt to brew a cure for boils. What, you mean like the one on your face? I mean, okay, it's pretty straightforward, you just move your arms in the way the game tells you to, but it seems to be working okay. Oh, what's this, five star rating? I'm impressed, Connect. I'm impressed. I know I don't look it, but trust me, I am. But now we're on to the true test. Can we cast... Wingardium Leviosa. Now, you try. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa! Try again. Is this microphone broken, or am I not giving it enough Leviosa? Well, if you can't hear me, what am I supposed to do? I don't know if you guys remember, but in the Harry Potter movies, they cast spells. So how am I supposed to keep playing? You can also use movement to select a spell. To select Wingardium Leviosa, put your arms in this position. You're joking. Excellent. You hand yourself into the FBI to select a spell. I don't remember that from the movie! Okay, so that was a disaster, but at least the motion control still worked pretty well. Hey, hey guys, guess what I'm doing in this picture? I'm casting a spell in Harry Potter. Anyway, we now have our first boss battle against the troll in the bathroom, but there's just one problem. I don't know which one is the troll. <laughs> the toilets have big enough gaps for me to come and see you. Oh, 
no! Watch out, 11-year-old boy with beard. The troll is coming to get you. There's only one thing you can do to get away. Bend your kneecaps in the wrong direction. When Professor McGonagall sees Harry catch something in midair while on his broomstick, she gets moist. Hey, everybody, look! Here I am, the youngest Quidditch player in a century, with a face that's a different colour to the rest of his skin. <laughs> to be fair to Connect once again, though, this does work surprisingly well. It's not complicated or anything, but it's certainly functional. Steer left and right by leaning, reach out your hand to grab the snitch when you're close enough, and, okay, would you look at that? We've skipped a lot of this story because we're already at the end of the first movie. Off we go to fight Voldemort, I guess, but before that, we need to get past a locked door with a million flying keys surrounding it. We're looking for a big old-fashioned one. Probably rusty like the handle. Ron, you're 11. Why do you sound 36? This minigame here... Ugh, it is a... Dumble snore. You just float around as still as a statue while using your body to stop keys from flying by you. And why does the end of your broom look like you sat on Tina Turner? No time to answer those questions though, because here we are, face to face with Voldemort's face and his other face. And even though he is a literal face grafted onto the back of someone else's head, I somehow look worse than him. By the way, do you want to see the greatest introduction to a main villain in video game history? We meet again. See what I must do to survive. Flawless. And so is this boss battle. Do you know what you have to do? Hold your hands out in front of his face for long enough, and then he just gives up. Not again! Not like this! No! Not even joking, that's how it ends. And if the first movie is gonna end so half-heartedly, then I will too. Might as well move on to the next thing. Im Scarred. In this game, you walk around a world that's absolutely terrifying because it looks all old graphics. You look for keys to open doors and eventually notice that some very strange things are happening. And you aren't sure why that is or what's going on until you notice this broken meringue. Then you pick up a heart on the floor that somehow looks like that and then suddenly... <laughs> I think my heart just stopped. After that first major jump though, the game actually crashes back to your desktop, and only then does it start becoming something truly special. You see, every time you open the actual application and then get to a certain point in the game, it will eventually close itself, and then you'll find the entity within the game has actually added files to your computer and is communicating with you outside the game. Images, text files, that's it. And that would already be a little bit freaky, but then within the text files and images are even more information about the story of the game and even solutions to puzzles, which then after you load the game back up again, will then start in a totally different location, only if you've read all of this stuff beforehand, and then it will ask you to solve the puzzle regarding the text file that you just opened. By the way, that entity is called Whiteface, and I suppose after all these years, we had it coming. I don't think that I'm scared as a video game is anything that horrifying, but the way it talks to you outside of itself and essentially hijacks your PC with a virus that that needs to be worked with in order to keep it going makes it one of the coolest damn games I think I've ever played. And the chasing around gameplay is just a bonus as you try and avoid this lad telling you why the best movie ever made is White Chicks. As an entire experience, if the creator wanted to make a game that actually felt haunted and that you personally shouldn't keep playing or else Benjamin will come after you, then it's as close to perfect as it needs to be. You aren't reading a ghost story about a game. You are the ghost story. You are living it as you play it. And I'm not easily spooked, but this game gave me the biggest scare of all the games in this video by having the game crash and actually have Google Chrome already open looking at a web page of Whiteface. After a few minutes of jump scares, crashing, closing and reopening, making files on your desktop, shitting in your shoes, opening web browsers and screaming at you, starting up by itself and Whiteface showing you his latest minstrel show, the ghost eventually makes you hang yourself, the game crashes, and it never starts up again. We did it, everyone. We killed PC gaming. In conclusion, I'm Scared is a game about a man with heavy shoes. Oh look, it's more cars. But now it's all about Mater. Who asked for this? The first thing you see in this game is Mater himself with his face right up to the camera and his tongue sticking out. Remind me why anybody asked for this game? Oh, don't worry, I know. <laughs> You want to know about this game? I'll tell you. It's Cars 1 again. Yes, I'm not pulling your jammies. This is the same bloody game as Cars 1, all the way down to the bony little finger. Same hub world, same objective markers, same races, same collectibles, except now we have missing sound effects for some reason. Disney, where dreams come true. The only things I can give Mater National some credit for are that firstly, you don't really play as Mater, so why do you have to scare me like that? And secondly, the controls and physics are a little bit better than the first game. You actually slip and slide around the dirt like a rally car this time, and the power slide actually makes you drift a little bit. There's a pretty useful tight turning button, there's more mini games, there's a recharging boost system, and the map actually shows you what events are around you and which ones you've already completed. However, this is still pretty 
messy, mindless stuff. You race on identical tracks over and over again with barely any different stipulations, and if there's anyone out there who knows how to do the best single lap around everyone in town, it's Trollope. I'm a little bit concerned at all the adverts in this game, though. Shifty drug? What the hell do you think they sell there? Do you think they would help me leak less? Okay, yeah, I think I'm just about done here. I'm gonna move on to the next game. <laughs> oh, oh my god, I'm a monster truck. This is horrifying. What madman put this in the game? Okay, in all seriousness, we're done now. Not because there's no more games of cars, there's plenty of them, but I'm just sick of looking at all of them at this point. Oh great, here we go everyone. Crash of the Titans. Okay, so this intro cutscene I actually really like. This shadow puppet art style with no dialogue is a very unique way to set up the story, even if it reminds me a bit too much of Jungle Book 2. And I don't ever want to be reminded of Jungle Book 2. Okay, so should I start addressing the obvious? That being these questionable character designs? I'm sorry everyone, I know this version of Crash has his fans, but not me. This is a standing up orange hyena with tattoos. I mean, who does that? Tattoos are for pricks. He's dressed up like a rejected member of Green Day and his entire aura reeks of the mid 2000s. There's no timelessness here. I still don't know why they did this and I don't know what's up with the voices either. Crunch is like if Tony the Tiger was played by Mr. T. I'm a bling. Come your mouth when you sneeze. But hey, at least Cortex is still pretty funny. There is always that. Make a sucker. Hey genius, I can't actually hear you. I'm really far away and I'm flying like a hovercraft or something. And I don't hate the new Aku Aku here, I can still tell that it's him, but that face he pulls when he's shielding you is a little <laughs> And yes, I said shielding. There's a guard mechanic in Crash of the Titans, and even a roll, because this is yet another 3D beat em up similar to Skylanders, except much faster, and it came out nine years prior. So this was actually the first attempt of putting Crash into a combat focused setting, and I mean, it works, but this is no Bayonetta. There's nothing complicated going on or different strategies you need to come up with at a second's notice. There's no dashing or darting around. It's all incredibly straightforward. Crash runs around like he's late for a meeting and most bafflingly, he doesn't even start the game with the spin move, which is like Sonic starting a game without being an annoying dick. You have to unlock the spin first and get this, if you use it for a little bit, it makes you dizzy. Crash Bandicoot, dizzy from spinning, which is all he's done since the beginning. This dude isn't Crash, he's a poor man's imitation. This is so peculiar to me, I never thought I'd live to see the day where the words Combo King appeared on screen in a Crash game, and uh, Crash, wait, what's this? What are you doing? Stop it! Oh, okay, I, I got an achievement? What, what was it for? The right stuff? What right stuff? What, you mean this? This was the right stuff? I'd say this was the wrong stuff! But of course, I am blissfully ignoring the other major aspect of this game which is presented to you on the front of the box and I'm mostly avoiding it because of what it's called. It sounds like you're pulling someone off. Basically, there are a handful of bigger creatures that you can fight that after you start hitting them, makes a star counter appear above their head. Keep wailing on them to fill it up? Yes, for some confusing reason, in Crash of the Titans, Crash can... <clears throat> jack certain beasts to do his dirty work for him, which usually means just doing the same thing that you would already be doing, but just doing it harder. How did Crash get this ability? When did he learn it? Why does he need to do it? It's not explained. Stop crying. I'd love to say more about this game, but to tell you the truth, I really, really can't. What you're seeing here, this is the game. You are pressing the same buttons, fighting the same waves of enemies, and getting by the most rudimentary of platforming sequences with barely anything resembling thought being needed to carry on. Gotta be honest, I don't like tag team racing, but at least the world was more interesting to explore. This is just unpalatable. There's nothing technically wrong with it, but it's easily the most boring game of the bunch with nothing standing out, nothing special about it, and nobody making a joke about Crash possessing monsters being called jacking. And it doesn't matter how good your game is, at that point, if it's boring, you've lost me. I mean, at least Skylanders, for as slow as that game is, allowed you to collect coins and spend them on upgrades that you wanted to choose. Here, you don't get a choice, you just keep collecting these blue balls and then you'll eventually unlock some kind of new move and that's it. There's no strategy or thought to any of this or any concrete reasons to explore. I'm being serious when I say this, this is the crash version of Sonic Boom. Yes, a fundamentally boring and unengaging beat-em-up with no thought required, basic platforming, new character designs, new unexplained abilities and a new universe for the characters to explore that's given no build-up, backstory or context. And do you want to see where I couldn't take it anymore? Right damn here. This is apparently Uka Uka. Yes, this Uka Uka. Way to completely toss aside your old fans that you're still trying to attract back into the series after the platforming apparently got too stale. I mean, I think that it's a cool as hell mask design on its own, but that is not Uka Uka. I will take the mojo and Bandicoot female back to our base. That's my nan. And Cortex, my goodness. You know, I've heard people complain about Cortex's look in Crash Bandicoot 4, and here I am saying, huh? You serious? 
You could always end up looking like this. Tony Hawk Ride on the Xbox 360. Tony Hawk rode off. So this game, this bloody game here, this seventh generation console classic just so happened to be developed by Robo Modo, the same lovely chaps behind Tony Hawk's Pro Hate My Life 5. And immediately you must be asking yourself, why such a big, big, big books? Well, because this entire game is controlled by this infernal thing. Oh yes, by using your body weight and these fancy sensors dotted all over the board, this game expects you to have some tiny amount of skating ability before going into it, or at least the experience of being able to stand and weight shift on a board. And I'll give credit where it's due. This thing is solidly constructed. It's not that flimsy. In fact, if you stuck trucks and wheels on it, you could feasibly skate on it. So well done. Which also means I can smash it over and over again against a wall and it will never break. Wow, after 10 years of games, I can finally ride Tony Hawk. And in order for you to see what the hell it is I'm experiencing, I decided to install this special Jim Jam cam so that you can get the best view of every angle once Tony Hawk gets ridden. So right off the bat, this game begins in the dumbest way I've ever seen. Why go to the effort of making a super expensive experimental gaming peripheral and then put controller buttons on it including a start button only to then tell me that I need a controller to navigate the menus and hit the start button on that anyway. If we were gonna do that why don't we just oh I don't know play the game with the controller. This skater just turned pro and now look where we're at. This is a true Cinderella story. Just a few days ago they were called up by P-Rod for a special mission in Southern California. Oh okay is that it? That's our story? That was terrible. What even was that? That explained nothing at all. Does, does Tony have scurvy? What you have in your hands is one of the most advanced game controllers ever made. Oh, you don't say. Here's my skater, and his name is Bungalow, because his hair looks a bit like a thatched roof. Now, if you're a little concerned about playing this because you've never touched a skateboard in your life, I really wouldn't worry. Firstly, because this thing doesn't slip. And secondly, because even if you have a little bit of experience, like me, you will not make this game work. I repeat, you will not make this game work. I didn't even do that! Oh sure, I can push the board, I can manual, and I can certainly ollie, but performing specific tricks is an utter nightmare. This board cannot read the more subtle motions it needs to to activate certain tricks, and so on this tutorial here, the first three minutes of the game, no matter how many damn tries I gave it attempting this trick here, it never, ever, ever, ever worked. What am I doing wrong here? Am I not riding you hard enough, Tone? And this is just for the tutorial. Sometimes even things as basic as an ollie doesn't even register. For a game so focused on performing tricks and keeping balance at high speeds while jumping onto objects, the fact that this controller only lets you perform something as basic as a jump sometimes is enough of a reason why it's a piece of shit that should never have been released. If a new player has just as much chance and luck performing a trick as somebody who put hundreds of hours into it, the game probably blows. And taking that aside, the the gameplay that you're treated with here can't be enjoyed since you approach every single objective in exactly the same way. That being you just trying to make a move happen. Forget combos, forget doing specific tricks over specific gaps or anything, you're just trying to do the basics from the start to the end. Mix that in with some pretty motion sickness inducing graphics and all the elements blend into a delicate mix of piss and vinegar. You're joking. I don't care about what fancy tech you have. I just want to spend my money on a game that works. And Tony Hawk Ride does not work. And even if you get it working, it's murder on your legs. Come on, this is a video game to play for fun, not boot camp for the Navy. We can sail the seven seas. Look, I just got some of my highest scores and fanciest tricks just rocking the board in any direction I could. How is this fair? And check this out. I was able to get better and more consistent results by sitting down on the shitting thing. How is it that I can't do this, but by sitting on my stupid ass, I'm able to do this? In fact, how could they even say this is the most realistic skating game of all time when Tony Hawk's own series already said that itself a few games ago in Project 8? So real, you don't just skate it, you feel it. Yeah, believe it or not, I couldn't find anyone online talking about these illegal rip-off games on smartphone stores, so allow me to pop the lesion. Let's start off with this gem, Crash Fox Skate Runner, developed by... <laughs> Crash Bandicoot himself. You can enjoy this Crash Fox skating games and cube block games by simply controlling your players that is stand upon rolling cylinders in Sky Roller games. Do you need help? App Privacy, the developer... <laughs> 
Crash Bandicoot. I can't wait any longer. Let's play. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? Crash Fox Skate Runner is a game where you swipe left and right to steer the classic PS1 mascot Crash Fox while he walks on top of Pringles, you know, as he's known to do. If you don't collect enough yellow to get over the gaps, you fall and die, which happens extremely frequently because there simply isn't enough yellow to drive into. There's nothing else to say other than it's perfectly. And then you get rewarded with an ad for Train Station 2, sequel to the critically acclaimed best game ever, Train Station 1. So why don't we check out something that's more obviously about Jesus with his name in the title? Like, I don't know, five loaves and two fishes! You all know the story. One day, a man went to the corner shop to get groceries for 5,000 people, but they only had five loaves of bread and two fish. Luckily though, Jesus was there, and he turned that small shopping bag into a feast. Only one time though. Sorry, Ethiopia. You know what? With stories like this, people eating nothing but bread and fish, kids nowadays don't realize how lucky they have it. They've got all the food in the world and they still complain it isn't good enough. Here's another story for you. In order to play this game, I actually had to sign up to a Bible study forum and purchase a yearly subscription to access the download page. You're welcome, zealots. My username is... Goddy has a great body. Now we need to pick a profile picture and... <laughs> There are some fantastic ones. Here are some of my favorites. Yippee! Sunday school! The famous religious figure... R2-D2. My superpower is Jesus! Help. The one I ended up picking, though, is definitely the best. Friend of the worm. It's so threatening! Who's the worm? Why is he my friend? Where's God? What? Who is the worm? I'm starting to think I donated money to a cult. So now I have pleased the almighty worm. Please don't kill me, worm. I have to fill out the rest of my details. First name, Span. Last name, Ish. City, Spain. State, Churros. Yeah, I think we're done. And here we go. Five loaves and two fishes, which should probably just be fish, and the word five is written while the number two should be written as a word like the number five, but I'm not gonna be that guy, otherwise I'll be accused of blasphemy. Five loaves, two fishes, oh lord, don't you know what my wish is just to be with you and serve you all my life. I was weak, but you gave me strength to see. Oh, okay, it started again. Is that all we're getting? Is that the whole song? Let's start this thing up. Oh, hello, young man. Nice boat you have here. Oh, yeah, you've also got very nice hips. Well, yep. Hello. Oh, I'm okay. Here. Wait, what's going on? Why can't I look up? Why am I stuck staring at his lump? His eyes are up there. Well, it looks like you're steering us in the right direction. What are you talking about? I just got here. Wait, where did I come from? Where am I? Who is moving this boat? In fact, scratch that. Why isn't this boat moving? We're going slower than Mary Magdalene's libido. And bloody pissing hell, man. These controls are so broken. All it takes is the slightest feathery tap of the keyboard and you go apeshit flying off in every direction imaginable. The boatman tells us we need to head to the town nearby and convince my uncle to come with us to see me. So off we go. And no, we can't go any faster because going to see the son of God is not that exciting. We then find my uncle busy working in a well with his lovely collection of JPEGs. And he's not happy about us going off to see the G's. So now it's time to argue with him. I know it's a long boat ride here to Bethsaida. So why do you want to go now back to the shore and listen to this Jesus teacher all day? And if you think for a second that these dialogue choices affect anything, you're a complete wrong man. Because in every conversation, only one of these choices is the correct one to get the game moving on. And if you pick the wrong response, guess what happens? The Messiah? Here? <laughs> well, now I've heard everything. I know it's a long boat oh, ride. Oh, for the love of my dad. What? You know what, though? He does bring up a very good point. Do you expect me to drop everything to go listen to a preacher from Nazareth? We all need bread. We do need to you know, survive, so work is important and I will stay to help you out. I mean, we'll get it done much faster if we work together and then we can find Jesus quicker. Oh, well, that doesn't sound right. So why are you telling me not to go then? Now, now, what the game wants me to do is tell him that the real life food and water we need to keep us alive isn't as important as Jesus' morning breath. And you know what? That convinces him. Don't worry, kids, I'll get you some food. In the beginning. At this point, Uncle Fester tells us to find some bread and fish in a nearby house for the trip. Only problem is, nothing here can be clicked on, or jumped on, or climbed on, or prayed on. We're stuck in perpetual misery that not even God could save us from. And I was stuck here for 15 minutes before deciding to give up and make my way over to some more buildings over there. I got there, 
and I can't even get in. Sorry, Jesus, I won't be there to hear your lecture. I guess I'll just have to go to hell. Thank you for playing our game and learning this important Bible story. We hope this story helps you believe Jesus is the Messiah sent by God to save the world. Well, actually, all I learned is that if you want to stop a man from finding Jesus, put a two foot wall in the way. Do you want to know how to train your dragon? Well, if you do, there's a video game that will teach you. Twice. So why am I playing How to Train Your Dragon 2 and not the first one? Believe it or not, it's because I couldn't actually find the original on any secondhand stores online in time for this video. Maybe it's a rare game or something, I don't know. But what I do know is that the first game's box art makes it look like Toothless is flying through an anus, so I'm glad I'm not playing it. You've gotta love the box art for the sequel though. Oh dude, what should we do for the cover of the second game? Make Toothless fly in the other direction. And uh, that's it. So what's going on in this game then? Little... Bit? Oh, little orbit, thank Christ. So after a little tutorial with perhaps the most annoying guide I've ever heard. Yeah, now tail steer. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we then get to fly through rings. Oh, dear. But the question is, who do I pick? The dragon with a low, annoying ringing noise? Or the dragon with a high, annoying ringing noise? After the tutorial, you're then left to your own devices to explore the giant island of Burke, that's actually what it's called, and you know what? This feels great to play. The graphics aren't exactly handsome, but the performance rarely drops, and the flying controls make you feel like you are darting around on the back of a real dragon. But once you start following objective markers and getting into the actual game, it unfortunately sucks its thumb and dumps. Out of the entire 45 minutes I played, I had one game of breaking targets and one game of grabbing sheep to put them in different sheep houses, but the rest of them was nothing but flying through rings. Lapped races while flying through rings, time trials while flying through rings, sheep stealing while flying through rings. I am fine with a few ring courses, especially for a flying game like this, but nearly every single match of anything I played here was just flying through rings. I know the back of the box says that it's mainly a racing game, so maybe I was expecting too much, but if this was a racing game first and foremost, they could have at least staved off the repetition by giving me different courses to fly across, not flying through rings on the same island over and over again, often with other dragons who love to throw you off your dragon, and yes, it is very funny, so thanks for making me laugh at the floppy teenager falling down a cliff. Aside from getting bored though, do you want to know why I eventually had to stop playing? The voice of your main character. Yeah! That's it, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah. Oh, mayday. Uh-oh, mayday. Hey, yeah. Oh, mayday. How to train your dragon too. Coming to theaters on World Death Day. Slender the arrival. Well, in the last game, he didn't arrive at all, so I'm excited. The story here is that after an area hiker failed to report back into park staff, Slender the Arrival is basically the original Slender again, from the same people actually, but now with a budget, which means better controls, better presentation, an actual story, different scenarios and things to avoid, and a proper beginning and ending with set pieces. And you can tell those higher production values from the very start. You can now sprint while holding your torch up. And for a small team of indie devs back in 2013, the game does look really good. I'm not sure about your man's stance while walking around with his camera glued onto his face for no reason, but it's okay, it's okay. It's automatically better just from- <gasps> Ooh! Oh! No! There he is! The man himself! Slender the Leaving. This is nowhere near as slow as the original game, good god. But this is where I will actually praise the original over this version. Yes, it's stupid and cheap that I died twice because the game just decided I lost, but at the very least, there was tension in the fact that the game could just randomly be over. But here, that never happens, and Slend is even less threatening than he ever was before. He's a little more aggressive with his teleporting around, but all you do whenever you see him is walk the opposite direction, every single time, and you will never get caught. Slenderman is now the meth addict that you avoid by crossing the street. He isn't even remotely unsettling. It's like you're riding a skateboard and he's a curb. You see him, you go around him. You see him, you go the other way. You see him, you go the other way. He's a long, gangly pothole. And I'm getting sick of looking at all these pages. What is it about them and why do you get so livid when people take them? Are you a novelist? Did you lose the only draft copy of your latest book, I Have No Eyes But Why Can't I Get a Service Dog? Luckily though, Slendy isn't the only thing to run away from like a little bitch. There's also the scariest thing of all. A child that can't do makeup. Don't get me wrong, it's still spooky though because in this part you have to deal with the Asbo child and Slenderman at the same time. But even though that is true, he comes out so infrequently that he might as well deliver your presence.
Don't you love it when you come in from the cold and your house is more rumbly than the wind? Then later on, you move on from a delinquent child and end up running away from Boney M. <laughs> oh, look, Slendy's also there. Better turn around and go the other way because otherwise... Oh, oh, right, I'm dead now. Well, at least I know what I did wrong and I will learn from my mistakes that I made. There's a bit here when you're in a storage tunnel under a farm and there's things in it, but none of them do anything to you. They just appear, so yay. Look, I know it must seem like I'm skimming over a lot, but I promise you I'm not, because most of the time it's just an expanded version of what we had before. You collect pages here, then you turn on generators here, then you close windows here until you get vacuumed out of the bedroom. Just because it looks a lot better doesn't make it any more engaging for me. And again, Slendy Tubbies doesn't do anything scary or even appear that much to mean anything. Even the trees pop up more than he does. At least I can praise the game for teaching environmentally conscious practices, like conserving power. Even when our main character gets knocked unconscious and dragged to a total different location by an extraterrestrial beast, he still remembered to stop recording and turn his camera off, ready to carry on the next morning. Oh Jesus, the forest is on fire. The forest is on fire. How do I get out? I can't see anything. Not now, Slend. I'm trying to get out of a burning forest. I don't have time to wonder how you dress yourself so well without being able to see the wardrobe. Oh, there he is. Can't go that way now. But don't worry, just like every other encounter, you turn around, wait a second or two, and then go back where you were before. Slenderman is a scrawny barrier that always stands in the way of exactly where you need to go, and all you need to do is de spawn him so you can finally cross. Oh, leave me alone, you inconvenient egg! In fact, and this is not a joke, the scariest part of the game for me was when I looked on this shed and saw that Oakside Park had three canoes available for rental. <laughs> Nothing else like this happened at any other point in the game, and I have no idea what triggered it. I guess because they look so similar, Slenderman's wife cheated on him with a canoe. Then after that, the second scariest bit of the game was when I picked up this note, and I was convinced for a second the game was reading my mind. You know something? I'm curious. Do you think if Slenderman ate too many donuts, then you'd have to call him Portly Man? When a stroke from boredom strikes, the damage spreads like a fire in the brain. When you spot any one of these signs, think and act fast. Face. Is their face falling asleep? Ass. Are they scratching it? Sitting. Are they doing that? Time. If you think that you see any of these symptoms, it's time to close the game and play on something else. To the life of Black Tiger. Okay, so immediately, I don't hate this menu. It's the nicest one we've seen so far, easily. Got some nice music, a nice logo, a nice background image. It's all nice. It looks okay in my books. I also really like all of these stylish still images whenever you get some story text in between missions. I mean, the grammar's a little wonky, but it's nothing I can't ignore. And then the very second the first cutscene begins, it all goes downhill. I paid $9.99 for this. Animal called as human is what I dislike the most. They smell bad. Yep, good enough of a reason for me to do some slaughtering, and just look at the quality we have on display to do that very same slaughtering. You think Bubsy 3D is primitive? No, man. This is 2017, and this is an era where if you don't hold down the attack button all the way, you only get the first quarter of the attack sound. I mean, let's be real, not a single effing sp Blacked was given towards this. If you can't even get the running animation correct without having a total fit, you aren't going to get anything else right. Is that the sound of the Arctic? Or my granddad blowing air down the phone? I mean, you can say that we're hunting all you want, Mr. Game, but we aren't really doing that. We're just running towards an objective marker and holding the attack button until we win. Hey, 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 hey where do you think you're going, young lady? You can't escape me! <laughs> You know, I may have paid a good chunk of change for this game, but some things in life are priceless. And that was one of them. On to the next level. I'm alone now. I was alone and will be alone. But I'm not lonely. Oh, well, that's good. Whoa, Black Tiger, how did you do that? We were in the Arctic five minutes ago. Did you get the next available flight to the jungle? No, of course you didn't. You're a tiger. Tigers can't use check-in desks. You obviously just ran up the wall, escaped the land of snow, and then floated over to the land of grass instead. This is legendary, people. You know that Dust and Elysian Tale was made by one guy? Sorry, dude, but you do not hold a candle to Life of Black Tiger by one games. Pretty soon, I'm sure there'll be two games. Then what are you gonna do? Like every other the game we've discussed today, you only do one thing in Life of Black Tiger. Follow a marker and hunt animals. 
and every so often eat them. Sometimes you don't even need to hunt animals though, simply walking over to a smelly patch is enough to finish the mission. My favourite mission though was when I had to survive from a pack of wolves until the fixed time. After I tried fighting them head on to no avail, I then realised I could just outrun them, and after that happened, I just hid on top of a rock and never got touched until the timer ran out. Hello? 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 Ultimately, I did give up on this mission though, because trying to fight the big bad boss of the wolves with my new female companion was essentially impossible when my partner just parked herself right there and watched me die. Why was the trailer for this shared on the PlayStation channel? Did Sony lose at Spin the Bottle? I want to know how any of this happened. Oh, and by the way, this is a game that is also completely free on the App Store. Go home, Sony. I'll call you a taxi. Just get out of my house. You've broken enough pottery. I vividly remember the excitement surrounding this one. I mean, stop and think about it for a second. It's a Star Wars game that uses your arms to control the action, which meant force powers with your arms and more importantly, lightsaber swinging. But that's not all people were excited about, because along with Dirty Lies the video game, there are also four additional main games to play through. Whoa. I suppose we'd better start off with the one they actually showed off though, that being Jedi Destiny. Ooh. But who do I pick from this classic lineup of characters? It's a problem to decide. Do I pick Ara Barotta? Zitara Man? Tren Alva? Fenella Drews? <laughs> Vanilla Druce! No, I know exactly who to pick. Da Singe. Da goddamn Singe. And that's a bit of a problem because I'm not ready for them. I'm only a trainee Jedi, and how am I gonna fight the dark side if I can't even avoid a metal sphere shooting me in the bum bum? Feel the force flow between you and the pedestal. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling the force, yeah! Now what is the one thing everyone loves about the Star Wars movies? That's right. Water. The lightsaber battles. They're climactic, fast-paced, passionate, intricate, and all of that is captured perfectly in Star Wars Connect, as you stand still and move your hand every so often to block attacks, after which you push the enemy back and then pretend to haphazardly paint a fence in order to attack back. Those are all the lightsaber battles are, and I know this because the Jewels of Fate game mode is nothing but lightsaber battles, and it's the exact same thing as this. So off we go with Yoda and crew to save the Wookiees. Time of trials, yes. Time of danger? Great hope in you, we have. <laughs> That's the worst Yoda impression I've ever heard. It's not even close. <clears throat> Say the same for you. We once did. Now we have to learn how to run, jump, kick, and sidestep in the Wookiee's training grounds. And I've got to be honest, the delay in the Kinect trying to read when I stop leaning forward is probably the best thing about the game because it means I'm able to perform the very basic action of moving forward and stopping at the right times whenever I want to without any issues at all. Your strength comes from the Force. Control it, you will. Wow, I get to move rocks with my hand and throw them at other rocks? This is what the Kinect was made for. I'm a true Jedi. After this, we're then given eight minutes of pretending to steer a speeder through the trees, occasionally pulling back in order to avoid getting shot at, and then carrying on. That's it. Nothing else happens here for eight entire minutes, aside from the greatest line of dialogue I've heard from any game ever. Trees! And after this is when you discover what the rest of Jedi Destiny is all about. Standing still and airing out your pants. This single movement solves all of your problems. Sure, you can be strategic by using the force to knock out multiple opponents, or do jumping smash attacks for wide reaching damage, but why bother with any of that when this single movement is able to deflect every bullet that's fired at you, bounce them back at your enemies, and then make you automatically fly towards every enemy and slice them into pieces. The only time I had to think here was when I was being blocked, at which point you just need to jump in the air to get behind the enemy and start waxing on and waxing off all over again. And the other game modes aren't anything to ride home about either. You've got the boring Duel of Fates mode, which I've already discussed, pod racing, which is basically just that speeder segment in the trees from earlier, but just more uncontrollable and more unplayable, Rancor Rampage, which is honestly just dull, even though every single family on screen is dying horribly. But that's not the problem, it's repetitive. Who would have thought that genocide would be repetitive? Sure, you have missions to complete, like throw up person a certain distance or land on top of a person. What the fuck? You don't need to think really. Just do this and you'll be set. Stomp around like a big baby. Wave your arms in the air like you actually care a little bit and watch in horror as this family friendly Star Wars game included a mode where you literally eat a father of four after stepping all over his house. Just don't bother trying to charge though. The game seriously does not work when you try it. I am really trying to make it work. What do you want me to do game? I'm copying the movement. I look like I'm trying to start a car from the 1930s. Why can't I make this thing charge? <laughs> but all of this, 
This isn't why you stayed this long into the video, was it? Because there's one more game mode on Star Wars Connect that we just have to talk about. And it is known as Galactic Dance Off. Do you think Harrison Ford knows about this? Do you think he likes this? Do you think he did the motion capture for it? Even though I knew exactly what was coming when I clicked on this game, I still didn't know how to react to it when it came on screen. That is how much of a culture shock this shit is. But you know what? It's the best working part of the entire game. It seems to know how well your body is copying most of the moves, and it's hilarious. Oh, it's fun, shut up. They took the song Hollaback Girl and changed it to Hologram Girl with Sebulba on the front. Get a sense of humor. In fact, the only thing that stopped me from playing any more of this is one simple fact. I can't dance to save my life. Those famous Bigfoot tapes are not real, and I'll tell you why because they were filming me. But hey, at least my girlfriend Keris can dance, so she took over the second I gave up, and she will do anything for a till of the hand. Wally on the Xbox 360. Well, well yeah, it's, it's, it's supposed to be Wally. The, the holographic sleeve on this thing is completely borked. Just look at this though. It's like Wally exists everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Anyway, we start the game off with a lovely little cutscene, and then we, I got an achievement already for watching a cutscene. I haven't done anything yet. That has got to be one of the most pitiful participation achievements of all time. And I got one for pressing the left trigger in B movie. Oh no, watch out, Rex. What are you doing here? You're in the wrong game. Did you try and escape the zizzle? So far, this is looking like a pretty substandard platformer. Huzzah. But at least I can say that the controls are stupidly fun here. Not only can you roll up into a cube every time you jump and then hold the jump button to stay in cube form, which is a brilliant way to get around, especially downhill, and feels very, very fun to pull off. But you can also carry things and throw them with very snappy controls, and you get to carry three things at once. Oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ, wall! Did you- did you destroy the Earth? Was this your fault? What we have here, at least from what I played, was a linear puzzle and physics platforming game. And to be fair, it's pretty damn fun for a kid's game. Not only because the puzzles are pretty fun, but because Wally -E is an adorable little nugget to control around. I have to mention this role again. I can't describe how zippy and smooth this is to pull off. But that's not all we have. The platforming isn't too bad either, and there's a nice balance between exploration to find batteries and puzzle solving with grabbing the correct kind of object and throwing it into the correct place to make things happen at the correct time. Only problem is, yeah, the camera is not very good at all. Oh, stop looking at me like that, where's Wally? It's your game that we're playing. I do kind of like the visuals here though. It captures that sheer desolation and sprawling urban jungle atmosphere perfectly, even to the point of the dystopian nightmare consumerist pristine spaceship aesthetic being nailed later on. And if you like the movie, the amount of Easter eggs and details are off the chain. I loved seeing the broken road signs named after the evil corporation by and large, and when the autosave came up and told me that it was sponsored by by and large, I giggled a bit. You even get to play as Eve in her own unique sections sometimes. You've got on rails tunnel flying while you blow things up with lasers, and open world flying scavenger hunts. And much like with Willy, these bits control great as well. Just look at how responsive the controls are, even on a slippy surface. Wherever you point the stick, you turn. No delay, no slow turning, the weight feels right, I can do donuts, and it's these controls alone that make the whole game pretty damn good to play. Crash Tiki's Choice, it's like the Teen Choice Awards. It except culturally insensitive. Boom, down, now this game is a single button. Yeah, that's it. Make a question, then touch the tiki mask. Okay. How do I become more attractive? Oh. Eat fruit. Can I command an army of angry bats? Oh. Anything is possible if you try. Oh, you know what? This thing isn't too bad. What should we ask now? Um, how many spoons of sugar is best for a cup of tea? Oh. Eat fruit. Oh, okay. We were doing so well. Right, let's go heavier. How do we solve world hunger? Eat fruit! How do I lose weight? Eat fruit! How do I gain weight? Eat fruit! When am I allowed back in the rowing club? Eat fruit! How do I grow fruit? Eat fruit! How many babies am I legally allowed to step on? Ooga booga! Oh, screw this fool. I'm gonna ask Ooga Ooga for his advice. When is the best time to take pasta off of a boil? <laughs> what is the cure for AIDS? That's not my problem. The next game we're taking a look at is Samael, the Legacy of Ophi- 
Uh, of the off and it begins with some deep and insightful quotes. I will be present throughout spring, summer, autumn, and winter. That's good to know. But when do you want your holidays? Okay, so from first glance, yeah, it doesn't visually look as bad as what we've had so far, but I'm still not too sure. No, that's not your screen. That's the total lack of vertical sync that the developers didn't bother to fix, meaning the entire game is going to look like the top half is running away from the bottom half. But who, pray tell, developed this game? It was made by a thing called Gilson B. Pontes. And if you didn't know that now, you'll know it within the next 30 seconds. Character and mechanical design, Gilson B. Pontes. Art director, Gilson B. Pontes. Hair and makeup, Gilson B. Pontes. Sound director, Gilson B. Pontes. Stinky poo poo wiping, Gilson B. Pontes. Produced and directed by Gilson B. Pontes. Man who made my sandwiches, Gilson B. Pontes. And so, boys and girls, who made this game? Um... Gilson B. Pontes? Austin, you're a genius. How did you figure that out? Well, actually, that's because it's my YouTube name in reverse. Pontes B. Gilson. And you'd think that after the intro cutscene, you know, with the credits, that you wouldn't see the name Gilson B. Pontes again. But as soon as you start playing, you see it another ten times. In fact, you see his name pop up so much that I managed to die during his own gameplay credits before they even finished. Now, I've heard of a game trying too hard to be like Dark Souls, and Samael does indeed do that but took the dark part a little too literally. I can't see a single damn thing in this miserable greenery. Even with a flame sword, it's not lighting up anything around me. This is just a muddy, incomprehensible mound of old jam. Even worse, when you get to the meat and potatoes of the game, the combat, that's when everything comes full circle and it falls apart. The sword swinging is way too slow. There's a stupid slow-mo button mapped to the same button as the dodge button. And from what I experienced, one hit and you're dead, which then means you respawn at the beginning and then have to look at the Gilson B. Pontes exclusive credit sequence all over again. If you can believe it, this game didn't only come out last year. Yes, this is a 2019 PS4 title, but it also has a base price of, get ready for it, <clears throat> $29.99. I managed to snag it in the January sale, but Christ on a bike, $30 for this. Not even a little bit of stuff hanging out makes it worth it. And you know what's even better? This game is the most recent entry of a trilogy. A try loggy. Here we have Sword of Fortress, the Onion Museum, and take a guess who made it. Yeah. Gilson B. Pontes. We start off with an accurate date and location so we can thrust ourselves into this fantasy world properly. We're apparently in Megiddo, and the year is somewhere between 216 BC and 1815 AD. So the hardest part of this game is picking between the 2000 years it could be set in. This game came out in 2018, so it's not quite as recent as the other one, but that's pretty impressive considering this is the best looking game from our old mate Gilson we've seen so far. It's not mind blowing or anything, I mean this branch is going for a nice float, but considering this game is older than Dark Souls 4, Dark of the darkening dark, I'm willing to muster a little bit of praise for it. Where the game fails entirely is with everything else though. You see this running speed? That's as fast as you're going, and our first objective marker took me four minutes in total to run towards. And that's four minutes of absolutely nothing else going on. Only running to reach the first boss. And then when you finally reach the boss and get shanked in one hit, because of course you do, you respawn, right at the start of the four minute run. This then brings us over to the first game of the Gilson B. Pontes epic trilogy released in 2017, Spear of Destiny, the Gilson B. Pontes. And this time we actually have some voiceover to fill us in on the game's world. This fantastic ancient world has been invaded by powerful enemies who rule in the dark several centuries have passed. I didn't say it was good, I said it was there. So what do we do in this game? We have to look for all of the hidden relics that aren't hidden at all because they're pointed out for us, defeat the enemy guarding the relic, and then go off and find the next relic. Relic. Out of the entire collection of Pontes games so far, this one, while still not good at all, is easily the most playable. Your running speed is good, you have a health bar and stamina meter, and buttons actually do what they're supposed to do. But this means nothing when the game's frame rate runs as smooth as a rusty bike chain and the jumping animation looks like we take a quick hop and forget we're supposed to leave the floor afterwards. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it past enemy number three, but I felt like I'd be able to find something really worth my while if I ignored all the objective markers and just had a look around the world. So that's what I did. And would you look at that, I found myself a river. Do you think we can go swimming in it? You know what? I think we found the Tommy Wiseau of video games. Pretentious titles, useless writing, bad acting, objectively terrible production, and with a million credits all going to the same person. Gilson B. Pontes is the Tommy Wiseau of the PS4. This set me back 1189. 
1189. In fact, altogether, this collection of delightful Gilson B. Pontes games set me back 4687. In a world where for the same amount of money we could buy a pre-owned copy of Spyro Reignited and the Insane Trilogy together for six genuinely incredible games, why are Sony okay with these being on the store? Alzheimer's. Wait, no, no, that's not what- Amnesia The Dark Descent is a first-person survival horror stealth puzzle large Big Mac meal with carrot sticks that came out in 2010 and is the first thing that I think of whenever I think viral horror game. There were probably more popular scary games before this, but I don't care. Straight away, the game lives up to its namesake because the main character doesn't remember what his own name is. What have I done? Don't forget, some things mustn't be forgotten. So in that case, my name is Rethethef. And let me tell you, this game is scary. And if you don't like strawberry jam, windy doors, and men that can't walk straight, this'll be too much for you. That's what you're doing for most of the start of the game, honestly. Following spilled ice cream, avoiding doors blowing off everywhere, and falling over. And you begin to wonder what the big deal with amnesia is. The game and the disorder. Because, I mean, you only forget a few little things, like your shopping list or your wife. But don't worry, because there's a very nice old fruitcake telling you all the backstory you need as you go through the game and your memories start coming back to you. What did you call it? The inner sanctum. My most precious chamber, Daniel. And considering everything else you'll see in this castle, he really is the nicest man in the world that only wants to help you. But like I always say about the nicest people, do you know what an anagram of nicest is? Incest. So... <laughs> and you'll quickly find out why. There's skulls in the cupboard, there's an electric hole, there's an invisible monster chasing you in the water, there's a dead body trampoline, there's a single beautiful bunch of flowers growing in the middle of the torture chamber, the castle is growing skin, and there's a baby throwing up into the bumhole of a man. Speaking of bumholes, that's what's chasing you in this game. Walking, grunting bumholes. They waddle around looking for you in the darkest depths of the castle, forever wondering how different things would be if they didn't go for that lockjaw surgery. And this thing? This thing is like if Disney did a live-action remake of Pac- Man. So obviously you don't want to be face to face with these mangy old flaps because they look a little intimidating and they'll kill you. That's another less important thing. But for some reason, our main man Daniel is in Daniel about being able to defend himself. He can pick up everything around him and lob it around like an Australian, but it doesn't matter if you can lift a rock or a sack or a book. It won't make a dent on anything around you aside from the environment for some really cool and clever puzzles. In its rawest form, this is a stealth game. The only way out of a sticky spot is to run or hide. And hiding won't save you forever because in all of the best hiding places, even the shirts are dead. You run, you hide, you pray they don't spot you. And even better, while hoping they don't spot you, you can't even look at the monster for too long, lest Daniel San wets himself and starts losing his sanity. Essentially, amnesia is a big smelly puss simulator. I know violence isn't always the answer, but he's clearly okay with cutting off limbs in his memories and even drilling holes into heads in the present day, so cut this bait of shit out. If you can pick up moldy bread, you can hit these things with something. One thing you don't want to throw anything at, though, is this nice young man. This is a gripper. Another important thing, light. See, if you don't have enough oil in your lantern or don't have any tinder boxes that you find scattered all over the place to light torches, lamps, and candles, you are stuck in the dark, which also ups the difficulty in a different way, by making you start hallucinating. Usually it's just cockroaches on the screen and on the floor, and yeah, whatever, I'll have cockroaches on my face, no sweat. At school they used to call me Jim Roach. But then it starts getting way more obstructive, like making you hear noises and voices from all angles around you to make you try and hide from something that isn't there, and eventually your vision will turn into how your eyes go after playing Guitar Hero. Movement and navigation gets trickier, and then you have to consider the light. You need light to stay sane, but then too much light not only drains your limited resources, but also makes you way easier to spot to the monsters. So you've got to balance light, hiding in the darkness, sanity, and not looking too long at the enemies, while trying to figure out where you're going, while trying to find hidden items, while trying to solve puzzles, while trying to be quick so that you can serve your light, but not too quick so that the sprinting alerts the enemies while the deathly bellowing music screeches at you while you're being chased. And when all of the pieces fit together at the right time of night with the right pair of headphones, it's enough to make you by the way, if light is so vital to my survival, why can't I just pick up candles? I'm more than okay rubbing against them, and that's fine, but leaving them here seems really stupid. You're not Daniel, you're Daniel. But don't panic, everyone. It's okay. I've got a dead rabbit.
In Amnesia, you'll be going everywhere. The library, the machine room, the prison, the sewers, the Morge Simpson. And like I've said already, there are puzzles too, which I not only really enjoyed figuring out, but also make a great bookend to the running and hiding and item finding you'll usually do beforehand. And I love it when my flow is even and stable. Amnesia may be 13 years old now, but it has held up super well. Everything it does complements each other and blends into a gourmet sorbet, and I can totally see why at the time it went viral, and why for my YouTube feed back in the day, it kickstarted a new dawn of horror game playthroughs. It also has raw meat, but Agrippa doesn't need that. Well, that was the start of the video, wasn't it? Oh yeah, you were all waiting anxiously for this one, weren't you? The one Kinect game I don't think I've heard a single positive thing about. What a nice intro this is. Truly, I'm grateful, because if you leave the screen or sit down for any reason, this little Johnny up here disappears and the whole game pauses. And no matter how much I tried, this cutscene is unskippable. So for the first minute and a half of the game, you are stuck just standing there waiting for a video to end like you're waiting for a bus, but instead of it eventually taking you to the high street, you're taken to one of the worst racing games ever made. I was able to get by every single one of the tutorial missions with absolutely no problem though. First time attempt on all fronts actually, but you know you're in for a good time when the little man telling you that you're perfectly visible from the Kinect turns from chirpy white to sad red after the intro ends. It didn't matter what I did, what lighting conditions I used, what distance I was from the sensor, what space I left myself, even resetting the game and trying again. During the intro, it was happy as Larry, but during the game, it was piss off. And you know what? Maybe that is what caused this game to be virtually unplayable. Maybe it was my end that was the problem. Except it most certainly wasn't because I recalibrated the damn thing three times and it knew exactly where I was every single time. And more importantly, the menus worked absolutely flawlessly for me. Look, I've got no issue at all with any of this stuff. It knew what direction my feet were standing, it knew every time I did a jump, and I could even clean steam off of the screen with my hands perfectly. But leaning my body slightly backwards to turn a corner? Oh, no way, hose. That's far too much for this little puppy to handle. We can't turn any corners here. What do you think this is, a racing game? The best position I could come after three races was fifth. Sonic Freeriders doesn't work. How many more ways can I say that? It murders your back with all the leaning. It hurts your legs with how high you have to jump for it to register. It hurts your arms with all the flailing you've got to do. If you really just desperately want to ache, go outside and run into a wall. It's free. Sonic Freeriders is simply a grim experience from the second it starts when the theme song screams its lungs out at you until you start a race and you slip a disc. Not even the menu's audio tracking works. Just watch this. I'm saying the word next and the Connect knows I'm saying the word next because it's lighting up right there. And in fact, here is me using the microphone feature on Disneyland just so you can see that it does indeed work. Okay, here we go. Park map. Tomorrowland. Astro Blasters. But on Sonic Freeriders, like some stubborn toddler, it hears me but just refuses to do anything else. Oh yeah, you can say next? I heard that. Great! Next up we have Coco Crash Adventure Rescue. Jumming mission. Let's boot it up then. Oh shit off. Do half of these games not even load? I don't get it. Why would you spend any time making a game only to put it on an app store and not even have it start? Look, it just doesn't go. I'm trying. Go, jumming mission. Go! I want to jump! To give them credit though, they so nearly got the title correct. They were so close. It's like if the new Duke Nukem game was called Duke Unkempt. Crash the Fox Bandy. Your favorite hog wild, Crash the Fox Bandy, is back. Oh, I can't wait. Actually, before we get into the game, I have to ask, how many of these bootleg dumps are there on Android? There's none on iPhone, none on Nintendo, none on Sega. They're all on here. I'm more shocked than that Ethiopian kid that went to a water park. Do you know what Crash the Fox Bandy is? Oh, sorry, I mean Crash the V2 Bandy. I guess that's his engine size. Well, it's Subway Surfers. Yeah, that's all it is. It's an endless runner game for your phone, like Temple Run or even Crash Bandicoot on the run if you want to be a dick. Except in this game, you're controlling a blinding yellow fox in a baby onesie melting through the floor, and when the fox bandy gets caught, the racially questionable tribal men chasing you start making cowboy noises. <coughs> because why pick a side in the American Indian Wars when you can have both? And then all of a sudden there's a lovely ad that says how not to kill a plant. Yeah, I know. For most normies, Spyro ended as a series in 2008 with Dawn of the Dragon. But no, mate, if you want to call your game Spyro's Adventure, you're damn sure going to make it into a video about Spyro games. Released in 2011, the first Skylanders game was, at least originally, yet another Spyro reboot for a younger crowd. If we were fighting together in a war, against the same enemy, 
I would shoot you first. If you don't know what Skylanders is, well, I've actually already looked at one in an older video and explained what the game is. So do you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to put the clip of me talking about it right here because I've been going on for two hours. Can you please let me have this? Skylanders is a series of simple 3D beat-em-up platforming games in the Spyro mythos, except that it requires the use of a USB portal device in order for you to place different figures onto the portal and have them pop up in the game. Different figures have different abilities to get by different obstacles and unlock different secrets. Thank you for explaining that, me. It was very hot. Now, the a copy of Skylanders I found on eBay was brilliant. Wanna know why? Because it came with a giant box of figures that I didn't want. Look at these, like, what am I, what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do with all of these? Well, I guess we can at least look at them. Who is starring in the final original release of a game with Spyro still in the title? Well, we've got Spyro, Sparks, Cinder, Fire, Spyro, Thomas the Tank Engine, Fish, Fish, Steve Irwin, Spyro, Spyro, Boat, and Shoe. Truth be told, I actually think all of these little guys are pretty cool, but I'm not here to be nice. Let's play the game. I am Eon, your guide in this world. But where are you, you may ask? That is a very good question. This is Eon and this is Chaos. Eon is good, Chaos is bad. And Chaos also sounds like he's taking one giant breath in while holding his nose. Long have I waited for this day to take my revenge. Oh, right then, level one. Let's see what's go- Oh, oh, <laughs> wait a second. I think my controller's broken. I can flame and I can charge, but I can't jump. Ah, you know what? Actually, no. Maybe it's just because this is the tutorial. This is a kid's game after all. The jumping might come later. Wait, so let me get this right. We've gone from gliding, to gliding and hovering, to no hovering, to no gliding, to no jumping. Yeah, all right, bye. You know what? It would be so nice of you to use your giant wings to get over this tiny little hop. But no, I've got to go all the way around here and walk into this bouncy drain cover instead. I mean, shitting hell, you don't even charge for longer than a couple of seconds before getting tired. I am starting to get sick to my guts with how slow Spyro likes to go in a lot of his games. Even if you wear a speedy propeller, a cap, it doesn't seem to make Spyro or any of his new bastard friends run any faster. And mixing that in with no jumping makes this not even slightly fun for me. Then as you go on through the game, there'll be side areas only unlockable from friends of a certain class, which I don't mind, but more often than not, it will randomly pop up and tell you that, oops, you're weak all of a sudden, time for you to swap out to wet Spyro, otherwise you'll take much longer than necessary to kill enemies that aren't weak to the class the game tells you to swap to for absolutely no reason. It's not really a video game and more like a sit-up regime. We gotta get those tubby kids their exercise sitting down playing games all day. So why don't we give them muscly thumbs and a six pack? Oh, and this dude here is called Gil. Hey look, it's Gil. What? The Gil section is over. Something that I didn't realize until now is that these figures actually save data. Yeah, they're not just a controller input, they're memory cards that keep data in their... Feet. So then, in one area, after swapping to someone with the correct class that I needed to, I ended up with someone born in 1947 that was level 10 and had a small business loan in the bank. That just comes with getting these figures pre-owned, I guess. Sure, I could reset them from the menu, but that means I'll go back to having like two attacks and not jumping anywhere and running slowly. So can you get off my dick? These cutscenes are really long and I don't know why you can't skip them. Come on, I don't want to watch any of this. I want to get to the next level of doing nothing but running around and hitting two buttons. Wait. You're a Skylander, aren't you? Yes. And you're a golf club, aren't you? Sorry about the lint balls, Hugo, but we were able to rescue Callie. Hey, Ben. Remember the time we saw Spyro the Dragon? And I was a freak! I know what you're thinking. Surely this isn't all you do in the main game, is it? Yeah, it is. You run around, spam attacks, and don't jump anywhere. What do you do in the optional challenges? Run around, spam attacks, and don't jump anywhere. Oh, wow, look at this incredible new land to explore. What am I going to get to do in it? Run around, spam attacks, and don't jump anywhere. And I'm sorry, I am still in shock over the fact that Spyro can't jump. Spyro the winged beast can't get over this tiny gap. So how does he get over the gap? He assaults a tortoise and shoves it into the gap to walk on top of it. That's how Spyro gets over a gap. I'm playing a game called Skylanders where you are unable to ascend towards it. Here's a tower I've got to smash. Don't you like smashing? Smashing is fun, right? Well, here's how you smash in Skylanders. <laughs> Even 
even when you get to something completely different like a turret section. In A Hero's Tale, the turret sections were frantic, extremely fast, challenging, and honestly, I kind of enjoyed them. But here, you... Please understand, I am not looking for much. Like Gandhi at a Christmas buffet. I don't need to own the world to be happy, but I physically am unable to understand the appeal of a game like this aside from the figures to collect, which you can do anyway without playing the damn game. And it's also great to play the game and then get constantly advertised to about the other figures I can get. Hey, thanks for buying our game, kids, but your parents didn't get you enough. Without the figures, what is this? It isn't really anything, and it definitely isn't Spyro. It's transparently obvious that the subtitle Spyro's Adventure was slapped on to sell a brand new IP nobody would care about if he was on it. Parade his corpse over the front of the box to pretend it's his game. But hey, don't go too far. We won't have him talk at any point in the game, or make a story about him, or have any of the characters address him by his name. You know, the name that's on the front of the box. Nobody will notice. Well, you know what Activision? I noticed. People like to not count this as a Spyro game, but if you're gonna spit his name on the box and claim it's his adventure, then I'm gonna treat it like one. And to be quite blunt, I've booked too many cameos for this video, and I don't know how to fit them in. Isn't that right, Blueberry, Dana Rage, Digiman, Digi to the next level game apologist? Guru, Larry, John Riggs, LS, Mark, Matt McMuscles, Nitro, Rad, Re Res, Tennings, Trav, Guy, Shafra, Scarfulu, Uncle Silver, and Wayne as boss. And don't even get me started on Elise. She threatened me with a carving knife if I didn't put her in this video, so there you go. Ah! Look! I found an anvil! I put it on his head. Perfect. I fixed his ugly. Whoa, what's this? I can upgrade now and unlock new abilities? <gasps> I can give Spyro flight? Yes! Thank you, Christ! Now we can still not go anywhere! Yeah! Drag, 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 oh, what's drag, that? The game froze? Drag, 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 oh, that's a shame. Oh, and the game is recyclable? Gee, that's good. I saved the trees. Connect Joyride. Sadly though, Connect Joyride is another one of those games that I just can't say that much about. Not because it's bad or anything, but just because it exists and it works, so I can't even joke about how terrible the connect is here. You pretend to hold a steering wheel, twist it to turn left and right, lean left and right for drifts, pull the wheel back and push forward for a speed boost, and tilt your body up, down and all around while in mid-air to try out some tricks. But it all works pretty damn well, so to be honest, like, what can I say? Do you want a racing game with no controller? Then what's wrong with you? I mean, then you should get Connect Joyride. For a game about racing built entirely around body motion, it's a nice little distraction that does its job well enough. And more importantly, it's legal. Instead, I decided to go for Sesame Street TV on the Connect because it actually does something really unique with the technology. It teaches you how to stop using your binky. Since this is indeed for toddlers, you aren't expected to actually do anything that taxing. So instead, you're simply given a collection of Sesame Street episodes in HD, all full length and all tailored around you you by using the camera. You become a part of your very own Sesame Street episode. And sure, you can't change what happens in the episode or anything, but you are taken along for the ride every step of the way. So if you're a kid who loves Sesame Street, or an adult baby in a diaper, what the f am I looking at? Then this is the game for you. Ooh, you know, I think I hear a dog barking. Are you sure that wasn't your wife? This wasn't the game for me. So everybody, this is what happened when I took a stroll into Sesame Street. There we go. We're in Elmo's world! And it's horrible! Oh god. Welcome to Elmo's world! Welcome to Elmo's seizure! What happens if I leave? Sesame Street was brought to you today by... The letter of the day! V! V for visectomy! The penguins of Madagascar in Dr. Blowhole returns again with his blowhole. This here, my lumpies and germs, is the first Kinect game I've ever played. Which was not only the best introduction I think I could have ever wished for, but also means I'm now opening myself up to every other flawless Kinect adventure at some point in the near future. Pray for me. Oh, bugger. Okay, well as far as first impressions go, this thing isn't too bad. It looks kind of cool at least, it works fine on the main dashboard for the Xbox 360, and check this out, I'm a video game now, but then I played this game and the fun stopped. Here is what happened. Please enjoy. Hello everybody, I am popping my Kinect Cherry. I don't know what to expect, I don't know what's gonna happen. The camera is freaking me out a little bit. Now, why don't you tell me your name? Oh, okay, we're leaning, we're leaning. 
We're leaning for the ice cream. Okay, right, let's go. Leaning. I jumped! It, it did a jump, I'm amazed. There's a chameleon right here. If there's a chameleon right there, it's not a very good chameleon, is it? This is insipid. This is so boring. I can see why this is a kid's game, because if anybody over the age of 30 tries to do this, they will end up on the floor with major back pain. Now what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, perfect, bitch! I lifted my hands up. Can't see you doing that. Oh, he's doing a flap. Flappy flap. Whoa, okay, we're changing characters now. Now we're lo we're completely lost tracking. It now thinks I'm leaning left and I'm not. Oh no, why? Why is that an oh no? Do you want me to bend over backwards and stick my head through my legs? I can do that if you want me to, game. Why, why did I get it wrong the last time? I thought that said terrible for a second and I would have agreed with it. Okay, go to the pigeon, throw. Go to the pigeon, throw. Go to the pigeon. We're playing a connected game for children and I'm now being asked trivia questions about wildlife. This is exactly what I wanted. Not only did I want to stand up from the sofa and not hold a controller, but I wanted to go to school. Furry monster? I don't know. Little man? Oh, come on, I can't get this completely wrong. Cute, because they are cute. That is incorrect. You're incorrect! I think even more importantly, why does a why does a quiz require bodily movement? Why do I need to use my feet? Like, God damn it, I'm already losing my bearings on where I am anyway. <laughs> That's that that picture? That sums up everything. That sums up my feelings. It sums up this game. It sums up the connect. That is as raw and as natural as a reaction as you're going to get because I didn't know they were taking a picture. Yeah, I think we can pretty much end it there, don't you think? Five Nights at Freddy's. I haven't heard of this one. Yes, it has all led up to this, hasn't it? You all saw it coming. The single most viral game, not just of this video, but probably ever, which just so happened to be a horror game from 2014. It's the one with that meme in it. You know the one, that meme. On three, one, two. FNAF came about from a guy who repurposed another game he made that was supposed to be for children but ended up being more suitable for adults, so then he flipped it on its head to make it a game that was supposed to be for adults but ended up being more suitable for children. One of the most unique and brilliant concepts ever. You are a security guard looking after a family fast food restaurant where the animatronic characters have gone wrong and they're out to rip off your breeds. Hello. You all know about it, so it's redundant me going into any more depth about it. But all I will say is this, without question, this is the scariest game in this video so far because this was the first thing I saw on the Steam page. Then it got even scarier when I started the game, because while worrying about all of the animatronics tearing my head off, the screen itself was already tearing its own head off, so I had to quit and then force V-Sync on every FNAF game I downloaded. You are the security guard of a family fast food party restaurant, just like Chuck E. Cheese, but this one is called Freddy Fazbear's Piece of Shit. You're on the night shift from midnight to 6am for five nights straight, and luckily for you, during those exact hours, the animatronics have the zoomies, but with more teeth. And by the way, you can't move. All you can do to keep yourself safe is check the security cameras all around the restaurant to keep track of their positions, turn on side lights to see if Peter Rabbit is hanging out there, or shut the doors to stop them from coming in if he is. So why don't you just keep the doors closed forever? Because Freddy Fazbear is the chairman of Just Stop Oil and he doesn't want you wasting all your power. You need to balance and prioritize everything you do to manage your power consumption while keeping yourself alive. But if you don't use enough power to keep your eye on things, then your punishment is... Same applies if you use too much power as well, except the difference is that Frederick Bear flashes you. Here's the thing about this game though. I don't get it. Like, I don't dislike it, but this was it? Really? This is the game that took 2014 YouTube G-words off to the moon in views? I will admit, I love the concept and the simplicity of the execution, along with the designs of the animatronics themselves. They aren't horrifying, but they are very uncanny. At least they aren't a bag of crisps in a tie. But actually sitting down and playing FNAF honestly makes me feel like I'm working, which I, I know is what you're doing, but all it boils down to is quickly switching through the cameras, putting them down, checking the lights, closing or opening the doors if you need to, and then repeating the cycle. Am I missing anything here? 
I got into a cashier's trance playing this game because it's just you repeating the same menial asinine task in a specific order and doing it slightly quicker on the next night. Five Nights at Freddy's is like working at a cash register until your boss yells at you in a fursuit. The jumps did startle me, I won't lie, but like that's all it is. I get startled every time my granddad falls out the window, but you just carry on with your day. It was a surprise. It's not terror to your absolute core. I feel absolutely no tension playing this. It's too repetitious and daydreamy for me to fully get into it. And all of this is for a paycheck of 120 smacking lips. Is your poor man really that desperate for money? He doesn't need to go through this. I want to help him. Five Nights at Freddy's Security. My guy. Why can't we move? Why do we come back for more after night one? Why can't we save power by turning this fan off? Why are there huge heavy metal doors in my room that stop all four members of E17 from getting in, but nothing similar built into their room to stop them from getting out? Why are the animatronics better security for the building than I am? Why don't we bring a torch with us? Why don't we have a candle? So here I am in the main Xbox 360 dashboard menu. Say hello. Oh, look at that. It actually, you know what? I'm gonna give Xbox credit here. This works surprisingly well. It knows exactly where my body is. You'll need a controller. Why? I'm using Kinect. Isn't the whole point that I don't need a controller? Anyway, as I was saying, it knows where my body is. It knows which hand I'm pointing towards the screen and which direction they're being pointed in. It's incredibly responsive. It knows when I'm swiping and in what direction I'm swiping in. Like, there's no... Okay, that went wrong, but overall it's surprisingly good, you know, it works. So, um, let's try out the best game to demonstrate the power of this thing, um, Raving Rabbids. Yes, what game couldn't be better at showing off what the Kinect can do other than... Raving rabbits. Don't know what these things are? Then I want to open your head and live inside you, warm and happy, not knowing anything about them either. Rabbids are coming to life. Everybody run. I've got a question for you. Who doesn't love the rabbits? I don't even think kids like them, which is very lucky because this game begins with you needing to smack one upside the head in order to start it. We then see a cutscene where a man is on the phone. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Talking with a goose, and then he suddenly throws his phone in the bin, which falls down a series of tubes and alongside a rabbit in an acid bath, the only place where it belongs. Then another one comes in and eats the phone, and then another one looks at a screen, and another one gets stuck in a door. Is this funny? Am I supposed to be laughing? Because I'm not laughing, I'm skipping. Off to the main menu, and I got an achievement. But you don't get an achievement for putting your hands up! You get shot! Now, I don't think I should mess with any options here that require more than one player, so I'll stick with quick play for now. After a loading screen, we end up on a game where we need to suck up all of the spaghetti sauce, meaning that we need to lean our head left and right to catch it all, and that's it. Oh. Okay then. I didn't even manage to do it that well. <laughs> nice try. Here, have some toilet paper. Oh, and while you're here, have a picture of you standing wonky. Oh. After this is another loading screen and we're thrown into another game. Raise our hand to choose an answer. We have to count the fake moving sheep, pick the correct answer, and that's it. After this, we're thrown into another game. Spin a pickle jar lid as fast as possible, and that's it. So that's all this is? A load of 10 second mini games back to back with no point? Yes. Yes it is. Well, I don't like that. Not even kidding, that is all this game is. Slowly moving from one tiny minigame to the next while being shown pictures of how much fun you're having. It's like if WarioWare let you play one game per minute. In fact, you are in loading screens for more time than actually playing the games that are loading. And after all the waiting, you're rewarded with a game that tells you that rabbits like shoving Barbies up their holes. Oh, what's that? You've got another picture for me? Great. Perfect. I look like a lamp. I mean, I can't say that the game doesn't work, because it does, but there's absolutely no reason to bother playing it if you're alone. It's just one tiny minigame after the other with no rhyme or reason. It's kind of sad, actually. Which is why they included a minigame that lets you play with your very own rabbit to pretend that you have a friend. Hey. What's the point of this game? What am I doing? Oh, Jesus. Why is it not working? Why, why are you half a bunny? Okay, doesn't matter, he's gone. Oh no, okay. He's now the sofa. I'm going to sit on him. Oh, he liked that. Now he's leaving. So um, this is this is a great mode, everybody. This is why you want to connect, so that you can have a fake... Ra I didn't mean to do that, but I'm glad it happened. So I can kick the thing, that's good to know. I can't kick the thing, that's good to know. Say, what do you want to be when you grow up? An astronaut? Great! A little slap will surely make him change his mind. Change his mind about what? Women's rights? Ah, oh, that's fun. Ah, oh, that's fun. This is shit. Fist of Jesus, a game that used to be on Steam and mobile phones back in 2015, before suddenly being removed forever, meaning you can't actually buy it anymore unless you already owned it before it was taken down. 
or you pirate it. What's really sad though is that even after all the effort I went through to download the game and emulate it, I really don't have much to say about it. Maybe it's because I pirated the Android version, it's the only one that I could find and get working, but this is one of the most basic beat-em-ups I've ever played. Buy something and get rid of the ads. Huh. <laughs> buy it. It's not particularly good or bad or even actually that funny. The story we have here is that there isn't one. But that doesn't matter. I'm smart. I know mathematics. Okay, well, Lazarus has come back from the dead and is turning everyone into zombies, and Jesus wants us to send him back to hell, otherwise he'll get told off. But other than that, you... Uh, the game is a beat em up. You beat em and you up em. It's incredibly straightforward shit. Each level is a little arena, you can pick up weapons, you have a few unlockable special moves, and you can either survive as long as you can, or kill a certain number of zombies, chickens, or dirty stinking lepers. I remember that bit in the Bible when Jesus said to the sick, do the world a favor and let me finish you off. You don't even control Jesus for most of it, which is even more disappointing. Instead, you play as Judas. You know, the guy from the Beatles song, written by Paul McCartney and Jonathan Lanoon. I mean, if you like the idea of killing sheep with the stars of Bethlehem, or pulling the hearts out of non-believers because that will make them join your religion, then by all means, illegally download the game and see for yourself. But it's just a bit too wishy-washy for me. There's not much going on here. And this Lazarus boss fight? Impossible. I swear to Jesus Christ, otherwise known as God Jr., that it isn't possible. Whenever you try to get behind him to attack during this phase of the fight where he's invincible from the front, he always gets multiple hits in or speeds off towards you before you can even get away safely. And you will die, 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 die. This is LEGO City Undercover, originally released on the Wii U in 2013, but then available on Steam, PS4, and everything else in 2017. I'm Frank, honey. Don't you dare call me that, we've only just met. I will wait for you inside. Okay, now you're making my stomach turn inside out. From the get-go, it's obvious that this game has a heavy tongue-in-cheek sense of humour, and I can dig that. Not every single line hits. At that age, he would have still been in preschool. Elementary, my dear fellow. But there are way more gags that do hit, and when the game wants to be funny with visual comedy, it can get pretty damn funny. A couple of silly one-liners later, and we get ourselves set up for what looks to be like a GTA-styled LEGO adventure. And for as dumb as that sounds, especially after LEGO Rock Band, it's true, this is LEGO GTA, except now you're a cop and can get away with citywide genocide without any consequences. Even though there's a crime in progress, we still have to drive responsibly. Of course. You never get into any trouble, it's amazing. Steal any car you want, disrupt any emergency services you want, attack anyone in the public sector as much as you want, drive up any pavements you want, shove aside any civilian you want, and if you're feeling a little bit frisky, you can completely obliterate any and all public services. Nobody cares, because you're a cop, and even better, you're rewarded with building bricks for special quest items every time you do destroy something. So there's a gameplay benefit to ruining people's lives too. Are my children's building bricks doing socio-political commentary? Oh my god, check this out. As your vehicle gets damaged, it actually begins to lose all of its bricks until it's just an engine with wheels. This alone is worth a purchase of LEGO City Undercover. And you're allowed to get away with all of this unbridled mayhem for the greater good of catching a super dangerous criminal who has done less damage to this city in his entire life than I think I just did in the last five minutes. I love this game. You think you can help Chase do that for me, honey? Uh, uh. Good boy. Did Lego invent simping? Don't worry though, breaking apart the city isn't the only thing you get to do. You are still a super cop detective, so alongside the huge exploration element that I actually genuinely love here, with all the driving, platforming, item hunting and environmental smashing, there are also plenty of puzzles to solve for bonuses and upgrades, and a smattering of crimes to solve with all of your detective gadgets, from footprint scanners to grappling hooks. Kick ass! There are some car chases through the city that lead to on-foot chases and arrests, there's rooftop free running and grapple swinging above the skyline. You even have a button to get your whistle out in order to stop any car you want in order to hijack them. You have a whistle. Can you blow my whistle, baby? Whistle, baby. So this is the title screen for Orc Slayer, everyone. New. <laughs> Is it? Okay, to be fair, I can't judge the entire thing based on a still image menu, so let's boot it up. Centuries ago, there was a great war. Much of the land was burned by an enemy now long forgotten in the minds of the world's people. After peace for- Did the game just realize at the end of that sentence that the next word wouldn't fit on the same line and changed it at the last minute? God, if they can't get the intro text right, I can't wait to see the game. This whole video was a mistake, wasn't it? I mean, just look at this. I'm honestly too scared to carry on, but at least this was one of the cheaper games today, clocking in 
in at only three ninety nine. I mean, what else would I have done with the money? Buy some compost. Oh Jesus, what is that? What is that? Oh my God, what is that? What, what was that? <laughs> Ham? Now I extend that question over to the game itself. What is going on? All you do level after level is kill orcs. That's it. You kill a certain amount of orcs, the tower thing drops down, you open the door to the next level, that's all you do. How many do you need to get? No idea. But I can tell you it's a number. Oh yeah, if you headshot the orcs, they also drop upgrade points that you can invest into power-ups. But you don't need to worry about that. Because every enemy couldn't be less interested in stopping you, even if all of their friends are dying right in front of their orky faces. Other than that though, what do you want me to say? The trees look like towels, the crossbow gives off more steam than Thomas the Tankin Dankin, explosions look like popcorn, and the orcs look like if Darth Maul forgot to get a haircut. Hello, I'm Cat Icarus. And I'm here today to ask you all a simple question. Are video games art? I don't know. In Orc Slayer, this is what fence chopping looks like. The exact same things can be said about Kinect Sports too, even though it doesn't look like anyone on the cover wants to be there. <laughs> well, actually, maybe the kid is a little bit too happy. Oh, 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 I love stepping on my son. Take Wii Sports and remake it so that you use your entire body instead of just your hands, and you have Kinect Sports. Just like Kinect Adventures, it's really basic stuff, but I can't knock it because it works really damn well. It knows where I'm leaning, it knows where I'm twisting, it knows where my knees are, it knows when I'm kicking, it knows how much force I put into arm swings, it knows how fast I roll my arms. It even knows when I'm having a drink of water. I'm so impressed I could just go and buy a phone on T-Mobile. The only sport here I didn't really like, to be honest, was football. Not only because I don't like it to begin with. I mean, just look at me. I'm thrilled to be here. But also because it's just a load of standing around, waiting for you to have the ball, waiting for a tutorial window to leave you alone, and then kicking it to the next person while you wait to have the ball, wait for a tutorial window to leave you alone, and then kick it again. It's honestly quite boring, and I won way too easily. I won. 10-0, and that was mostly from goals that looked like this. Go! One thing I did notice while playing both of these games, though, was something very cool about the Kinect camera itself. I've never seen this happen on any other Kinect game before, but I think the reason these two games work so well is because it actually tracks your movement as you run, duck, and jump in order to get the best accuracy possible. They clearly knew what they were doing here, and I can respect that for launch titles, but I still wouldn't recommend actually buying either of them. They're too rudimentary and wear out their welcome in a few minutes. And I mean, if you really desperately want a game where you fix leaks quickly, either have a baby or work in an old people's home. Five Nights at Freddy's 2, Pig in the City, came out three months after the original. That sounds promising, doesn't it? And when you play it, you can understand how. FNAF 2, in many ways, is just FNAF 1 again, but with ten times more shit to worry about. I don't like calling them FNAF. I'm gonna call them FANF. You're still stuck in the middle of a building, and you're still checking cameras, but now there's three times the threats coming after you at different times, three times the amount of rules each of them work with, three times the amount of things you need to interact with on your mouse, and three times the amount of times you'll end up dead because of it. On night three, I got less than 45 seconds in, and I lost. The dude on the phone hadn't even finished speaking to me, and it was over. And that's if you don't keep on slipping up with your mouse. I can't count the amount of times I just wanted to come out of the security cameras and put on my Freddy mask immediately to fool whoever was in the room with me, but then buggering up the mouse movement to do that. You've got to go down to the bottom of the screen and then up again and then down to another bit. It's just silly. There's not enough actual button presses for the insane amount of new actions to perform here. Everything is done with the mouse, except the flashlight. So yeah, you'll be looking around your room to check there's no one nearby, and then sliding the mouse to the bottom right to open the cameras, and then sliding the mouse over to each camera to check them, then sliding over to the new music box that needs to be kept wound up or else you lose your face, then sliding the mouse back down to where it came from to put the cameras back down, then moving the mouse back up over in an arc to slide down to the other side of the screen to stick the Freddy mask on, all of which needs to be performed within less than a second to keep alive, especially in the later nights, while you're coping with all the same stuff you have to go through in the original fan, including managing power, but now just at the flashlight, which is vital to see who is hiding where, but also scare away some of the animatronics before they come up in front of you, because now you have no doors anymore! I don't know how anyone can actually be scared of playing this when there's too much multitasking going on. I'm too distracted to worry about Foxy Bing Go.com, and I've got to use the flashlight, but only in bursts because the battery doesn't last long at all. So that means most of your game time is spent looking at the other end of your parents' camera when they've forgotten to turn the flash off. I eventually did beat the game. I wanted to see if I got anything out of the experience that other people do, but I just don't. FANF 2 as a whole package just makes me feel like...
The ultimate problem for me in FANF 2 is that I don't either find it scary or fun. It's a chore for me from start to end. There's too much going on, too many places to mess up with limited controls, too many flashes, you end up making $20 less than the first game and Chica is now thick. Oh well, at least we have some cutscenes this time. That's always nice. Well that was disgusting. What have we got next? Here it is. It's Crazy Fox Adventure in Time. It doesn't look like Crash at all, but this is what came up when I searched for him on the App Store, so I'll have to take their word for it. Crazy Fox Adventure in Time is a 2,5D platformer inspired by classic PSX games. It features low poly graphics, two different ways of characters steering, time of the day, and I guess the guy who wrote this got interrupted and killed by rabbits with this being his final call for help. The game has one rating, and it's one out of five. Excellent, let's give it a look then. Hey there lady, can I have your number? So I can ring you and tell you how vile you are? Right, so we need to get things crystal clear. This is not inspired by classic PSX games. This is a classic PSX game. It's called Crash Bandicoot. Ever heard of it? It's a great game. It has a warp room with level pads to stand on, wooden boxes with symbols on them, crystals to collect, red TNT crates, green nitro crates, spinning, crouching and slide jumping, and not being able to jump on top of enemies without dying. So yeah, take Crash Bandicoot side-scrolling levels and just make it not as good. That's what Crazy Fox Adventure in Time is. It's not awful at all. It works, but it just makes you wish you were playing an actual Crash game instead, which is as close to a compliment as I can get. Why does Crash Bandicoot keep wanting me to play Train Station 2? Oh, it even has this vehicle segment where you're on rollerblades and can't stop moving. But it controls like ass. it's totally impossible, it isn't interesting, and it's as fun to deal with as Taco Bell Bumwee. So by playing this game, I must ask, am I brave? or stupid. Well, I can tell you one thing at least, I've seen this bloody lamp bouncing on this bloody letter so many times now that I wanted to fall through the floor. <laughs> Brave is a linear platforming beat-em-up game that- Ah! Merida! Whoa! What happened to you? When did that dead cat get on your head? And despite how middle of the road it is, I think this is the best Pixar game I've played for this video so far. It's got elements of a twin stick shooter for your fast draw bow and arrow mixed in with basic combos and upgradable moves. And you can even unlock new moves to use like dodge rolling and different aerial attacks. Combine that with a few puzzles here and there and different elements for your weapons to switch between to take advantage of enemy weaknesses and level obstacles. And I genuinely am not fooling around when I say this is a really damn good kids game and I think you should Ooh, this game has Kinect on it! <laughs> Excuse me, what is going on with this bollocks? Kinect, help me please and answer me one question. Why don't you work? Brave on the Xbox 360 allows you to head to an archery range with the Kinect, and precision aiming a bow and arrow with dated and terrible body sensor motion controls goes just as well as you'd expect it to. If it doesn't register your aiming hand and where it's pointing, it doesn't register your drawing hand, and if you somehow manage to get that all working, letting go of the arrow is another thing entirely. What am I doing wrong here? You get three games to pick from here. Who cares? Piss off and leave me alone to cry. It doesn't matter because they're all the damn same anyway, at least when I'm even able to aim at the damn menu commands and make them go, when something even as simple as menu navigation doesn't work and screws you up, you know the rest of the game isn't gonna work out for you. Brave as a kid's game itself is pretty damn good, but the Connect add-on is the tambourine player of the school band. It's irritating, nobody wants it, nobody likes it. Now I've also heard through the grapevine that there's actually a Toy Story Connect game somewhere out there, but I don't have that, so I suppose I'll save it for another video. Who's ready for game number two then? Laws of Machine? I mean, it looks better than Orkslayer does, at least as far as the menu is concerned, and our backstory is pretty cleverly told to us through these company leaflets and newspaper clippings. What do you have to do here, then? You control copyright infringe bot and need to collect 100 volts worth of batteries in order to teleport to the next level and find Professor, who I think heard about Dr. Eggman and took too much inspiration from him. I mean, this is better than Orkslayer, at least, but it still feels way too amateur to be worth selling on the bloody PS store. I think it feels like it's at most worth $2 more than Orkslayer. Which is good, because it is. What else do you want me to say about it? What you see is what you get. You push blocks, you collect batteries, maybe even fly around on a jetpack for a while if your mummy lets you. Like Orkslayer, there's just nothing else that much going on. You have one objective level after level, and that is literally it. Except now, you have people watching what you're doing. It's also worth mentioning that the music, where okay, is so loud that none of the sound effects manage to cut through it. Not even the trophy noise. <laughs> And that is probably the most disappointing part. I love getting trophies, because at least I know that whatever I do, I'm gonna get a little noise that makes me feel better.
Next up is another viral hit from back in the day, SCP-087. If I'm not mistaken, the first ever video game based off of the fictional online wiki series, the SCP Foundation. And that's all very nice, but where the hell did I put this program on my desktop? Uh, oh yeah, there it is. I forgot that I keep it next to Funny Stinky Monkey Challenge game. SCP-087, according to the SCP wiki, is a seemingly endless staircase in pitch blackness in a small building in the middle of nowhere that might have someone or something living in it, and nobody ever comes comes out once they go down it. Sign me up! A simple premise and an extremely simple execution. You are a poor unfortunate test subject being sent down the potentially bottomless darkness of SCP-087 and all you can do at the threat of gunpoint behind you is keep walking down and report what's happening or, if possible, find out where the bottom is. And look, I know, stairs are only scary if you see Prince Andrew walking up them, but don't let the simplistic nature fool you. There is evil in these stairs, and it will mess with you throughout the entire game, throwing hallucinations at you that might be glitches in the game or actual danger, distracting you with sounds of crying and footsteps that aren't your own, and forcing you to keep on trucking forward as the floor numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, all right, I think I'm gonna go back up. Oh, wait a second. Oh dear, I can't. I'm on a Segway, I suppose, then I have no choice but to keep going down. But you can't stop me from having fun while doing it. Hang on, maybe I'm not on a Segway. This is a pogo stick. Why do I have the ability to jump this high when there's nothing to jump on? I don't know, gonna get on the railing? Yes, yes, I can! Right, now I'm gonna slip myself down the center of the stairs and hit the bottom in seconds flat. Oh, wait. I had pie. So over the years I've heard a few people complain about this game being boring, and I think I get why. It's extremely accurate to the source material, and it's injecting me directly with anxiety like nothing else. But after a while, nothing happens for so long that you start wondering what the point is. A game like this needs a delicate balance, because if you don't have that balance, then that can make the difference between a tan and a hate crime. Come on! I'm in the 50 floors now! I've gone down over 100 sets of stairs and still nothing is going on. You know, I love going downstairs backwards. The best thing about this game, though, before it even starts, in the settings menu, for some reason in the control screen, there are three fire buttons. Why? All you do is walk and look around. I would love to go mental with a Glock down here. I think that would solve all our problems. Then they made another SCP-087 game, but this time it was in a corridor. Let's be real though, corridors are even less scary than stairs. You aren't gonna wake up in the middle of the night and see a corridor creep into your room. SCP-173 is a sculpture that is completely unable to move while another living thing keeps eye contact with it. But if you so much as look away for a millisecond or even blink, it uses those small frames of darkness to move closer and closer to you until it can grab your neck and give you a great massage. Eight out of 10. Service was great. But now I'm dead. This creature is the main antagonist and subject behind the exceedingly popular SCP Containment Breach from 2012, made by the same person behind the stairwell and the corridor, and it went beyond viral even for the time. The success of it went so far past what the creator expected that they were able to keep updating it for years after it first came out, adding more items to it, more monsters chasing you around, more obstacles to get around, and now we're at a point where the original first draft of the game that initially went viral is still out there to download. But I want to see more stuff, daddy. So off I go into the latest available version and good lord in Christ in God in bloody, they have added so many more things to it that to me, the game is nearly unrecognizable aside from the intro sequence, the main menu, and a couple of rooms that I remember all too well from the early viral YouTube days. The story here is that my name is Bint and you're a poor old sod being forced to go and clean SCP-173's chamber from all of the body liquid and the bottom liquid. And while you're in the room with two other people taking it in turns to blink, the door gets stuck, the lights go out, and eee! Okay, so that was my name's fault. I am now rum and coke. So now this thing is out, and it's not only after you, but after everybody else in the facility, including security detail that were keeping locked up other various SCP monsters with their own unique quirks and methods of hating you or killing you or both often at the same time. And to make it all even worse, today was pizza day! Ooh, ugly. 
I bet you eat pineapple, don't you? Oh, and by the way, you also have a blink meter. Yes, you have to blink in this game, so you need to manage your blink timing with the space bar, or just forget about it and let it happen naturally. Containment Breach is very similar to Amnesia, but with way more aggressive monsters, even more obtuse solutions to some of the puzzles, and a much more open world design, to the point of you not knowing if you're heading in the right direction to get out or not until you realize you don't have the equipment you need yet. And I know that sounds annoying, but you're so distracted by every other thing in the building coming after you that it honestly does doesn't matter. You'll be close to figuring out what you need to do. Where do I even begin? Okay, right. So there's 173, of course, the main threat that follows you more or less everywhere throughout the game. Then there's 106, the old man that materializes slowly from the floor, walks through walls, and then kidnaps you to a pocket dimension where the only way out is to solve his labyrinth. Then there's 096, the total opposite of 173, where if you look at him for too long, he will lose his shit and then hunt you down in seconds. There's 049, who wants to kill you with his touch and then zombify you as bait for the other security guards. There's a chair in the break room that I jumped on top of and got stuck on and I couldn't get away from it until I quit the game and reset it. There's 012 which plays a song so intoxicatingly alluring that you can barely keep from walking away from it. There's 966 who are near invisible skinny coat hangers that wait for their moment to silently take you down. There's 939 who are pack based predators that mimic the sounds of other humans in the game to lure you towards them and then attack you. And my favourite, 714, a green ring that makes you tired. <laughs> Why is this here? But all of those that I mentioned aren't even the half of it. What makes it worse for me is that this game makes me panic like nothing else. Containment Breach, especially for a free game, is top tier for first person horror. Give it a look whenever you can, but I will be honest here, I am convinced that on more than one occasion, 173 cheated me. I snapped my neck so many times to this nubby bastard with an egg box for a face, and most of the time, I don't think I did anything wrong. Look at this. Look at this. Come on, man, leave me alone. Why did that count? Hulk Hogan's main event. Hey? Okay, good stuff so far. The game recognizes where I am, it reads all my movements fine, so let's head to the main menu and- OH MY GOD, WHAT IS THAT?! Where on the box does it say that you can play as a swan? Look at this thing! He's disgusting! And what is that all over his body? Is he covered in Cheeto dust? I have only loaded up the menu and hit start, but despite that, I can comfortably say this is the ugliest game I've ever seen. Look at Hulk Hogan here, he looks like an easter egg. And check out these cutscenes. These silent, boring, static, hideous cutscenes. Here I come, lads. Oh, what a chap. Oh my Jesus, look. If his face wasn't awful enough for you, then you'll be thrilled to know that the developers animated him a wobbling gunt. Oh God. Oh God. This is, this is, this isn't what I needed today. But most importantly, is the game any fun to play? What do you think? Hulk Hogan's main event is so bottom of the barrel, even the milk mold won't grow on it. If you ever wanted to play a video game adaptation of Happy Slaps, then this is exactly the game for you. You just throw your arms and legs in any direction you want and win. Occasionally, you have to guard your face, even though it would look better if it was smashed in, but mostly it's a load of invisible fly swatting until you win. And then, just when it couldn't get any worse for Captain Chin, you still haven't won the match, because you then go into another mini game where you have to pin your opponent down and pound on him some more. At this point, you really need to stop, man. He's already dead. Next up, we've got Zombies Run. Crash Bandicoot. Drive ahead through the zombie highway in a race to save your family. Arm yourself with an arsenal of powerful weapons. And is this a joke? Are you okay? Are you having a fever? Is your house on fire? I'm not so sure about this, but let's give it a look anyway. Allow Zombies Run to track your activity across other companies' apps and websites. Right then, here we go, Zombies Roadkill. Oh, it changed its own name. That's good, I understand it. Level 1. <laughs> Damn, guys, I feel just like a kid again playing Crash Bandicoot on my PlayStation. Look, it's got the taxis and the school bus and the machine gun. By the way, the truck here is impossible to steer. Look at this. Oh, come on now. I've been playing for all of 90 seconds and you want me to rate the game? Fine. If you're asking for it, you're getting it. Mm -hmm. One star. Write a review. Title. Cortex is too hard. This game is so hard that it made me scratch my scalp off my pretty head. Time to send and... Huh. Enter a nickname. Okay. Um... 
Halal meat. This nickname is taken. Enter another and try again. Who called themselves Halal meat? Okay, fine. Halal meat 5000. Done. Thanks for your feedback. You're not welcome. Well, hey, if I can give this game at least one point of praise, Zobie's Run is free to play. And believe it or not, can't believe I'm saying this again. Those are the only crash bootlegs that I could find on the iPhone app store. Next up is Bandicoot Tower, a game where you tap on the screen to put one box on the screen to build a box tower and hope to God that the next box appears above your current box because there's no pattern or rhythm to where the next box is gonna appear. And by the way, nothing seems to happen if you keep building all over the place. Steel Battalion. Connect finally has its hardcore game. Oh man, where's my Doritos? So despite this being one of the worst reviewed games of all time on the Connect, I'm not gonna go that hard on Steel Battalion, even though the game goes hard on the color brown. First of all, I'm grateful you have to sit down for this one. Thank you. But more importantly, the atmosphere here as it tries to make you feel like you're cramped inside a multi-person walking battle tank surrounded by endless death and intense warfare is absolutely spot on. The characters are surprisingly great when compared to other modern war games. It's loud, it's stressful, it's claustrophobic and- It's claustrophobic. This thing needs to read every precise body movement you make in the middle of a war and it's claustrophobic. Steel Battalion essentially demands from you the impossible. Wanna know why? Because everything on the screen here is important. This thing, that thing, that button, this knob, that knob, this knob. Hello. Everything here serves a very important purpose and you need to raise specific hands in specific places to enter specific side menus and touch specific buttons in those specific side menus. Need to see where you're going? There's a hand movement for it. Need to step back and check your ammo count? There's a hand movement for it. Need to protect your team from bullets entering the cockpit? There's a hand movement for it. Need to go into aim mode? There's a specific hand movement to do in a specific area of the screen when you're sitting a specific distance away from the front window. You also have to check out your crew by swiping all around the cabin. And you need to stand up occasionally. And you need to fly. This is simply way too much for the poor little Kinect to handle. And this game does not go easy on you. It's do or die with no help in between. You're in control of a walking tank in a war. Good luck, tweens. But that's not all, because the game also requires constant use of the control to move, aim, and shoot the tank. Which not only makes me question, why can't I just use the controller? But also, this makes the Kinect figuratively poo itself, because if you're sitting there holding a controller, your hands are too close together, and the tracking has an anxiety attack, meaning a load of this happens when the game demands precision and quick reactions. When everything works as intended, which is rare, Steel Battalion is extremely immersive and satisfying to play, if a little bit hard. I did manage to get through the first story mission on my first try, and it felt great to do that. But that was only 20% of what I managed to play. The rest is a total mess. <laughs> oh, man, I got a fist bump from the Winfield Powers. Yeah, and I got to give a chest rub to Natch. Another Cars game. It takes more than speed to become the ultimate racer. It also takes crack. So this game is the most modern that we have today. It's on the PS4 and starts with a TV show called Chicks Picks with Chick Hicks Dicks, where we get called out live on air to challenge another race car. And so, because we're live, we've got to accept it, otherwise we'll look like a puss. So naturally, in order for us to win against this guy, I'm gonna pick Guido. And I kid you not, Cars 3 is the same game as Cars 2, but just better. How is Cars of all the Pixar franchises doing this? It's almost like these bad movies about multiple cars were made as an excuse only to make merchandise. And 12 year old me agrees. In Cars 3, you've got the same power up, same good control, same stunts, same weapons, and same turbo system. But now with loads more tracks that are way more visually varied, so many more types of race, and a much faster pace that allows you to pick the next event you want to do in a drop down menu after each race, instead of loading back to a main menu after every single one. Being on the PS4, it also looks pretty damn gorgeous to be honest. It runs smoother than the other games, and I mean, you can even customize the colors and accessories for the car you pick. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. Smacked. The music is mostly filler background noise to be fair, but other than that, this is a bona fide keeper. Even the track design is great, since there's like a million different ways to go, routes to take, shortcuts to discover, and because of that, it makes the computer players an actual challenge, even on normal difficulty. I nearly lost plenty of races because of the added challenge here. I'm amazed, I've got to be honest. Wait a second, that isn't a bee. 
It's a hand passing me B movie on the- Ah uh, yes, from one meme to another, what better way to rinse my brain out than with jumping two console generations from PS1 to Xbox 360. Contains no material likely to offend or harm. Thanks for the warning, B movie. I never would have figured. So B-Movie the video game was developed by the developers of Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled, b -Nox, and I'm convinced that they were picked for the sake of a pun and nothing else. Oh, and don't worry, that is not the only B pun they have. I've got some too. I hadn't heard about the video game. It's both challenging and entertaining. Well, you know what, lady? You're a lying cow. Because this is without a doubt one of the easiest games I think I've ever played. You get an achievement for getting into a car. No, not driving the car, getting inside the car. And you even get an achievement for pressing the left trigger. I wish I was making that up. You can hijack any car in the whole game, actually. This is more or less a kid-friendly version of BTA. Hey! Even better, there's no consequences for that either. You can even steal cars that are already being driven, and the bee that you take it from just drops whatever he's doing and becomes your chaperone. You know what this game reminds me of sometimes? Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm assuming it's a collectathon at least, because to be honest, I didn't really play the game. It was way more fun to break it into pieces. That is, of course, when the game isn't pestering me every 30 odd seconds yelling at me to go to an objective marker. Come on, you give me this huge world to explore and won't shut up until I comply? I'm afraid I'm gonna have to be a naughty man and disobey. <laughs> You really should get a job. Well, you should really walk around the bin. No, stop it. No, don't invite your friends. Get your weird cloned granny lovers off of my porch. I want to crash my car. Who's the unlucky insect in the way today then? Oh yeah, it's definitely you. Get ready to feel my sting a bit. Oh, well that was disappointing. Just gonna drive a little bit further, push you into the corner and yeah. I think I'll leave you there. You know what? All the residents of this hive are totally screwed up now that I think about it. I mean, what in the blazes is going on over here? Hello? Are you melting? Is anybody gonna help him? Oh! Ooh. No worries, everyone. He buzzed off. Hey! Okay, so I hijack this guy's car, force him to crazy taxi me over to my objective, and that was a grave error because now he's following me to the ends of the earth and is stuck in the lift with me to continue the story. I'm terrified. He looks like he's about to unhinge his jaw and swallow me. After this, I decided to actually try playing the game, and once I ignored my surroundings and went from point to point, that's when I noticed that this is a job simulator, and it is horrifically dull. I get it, they want me to fit in with the hive and do my job like a good little subservient worker bee, but I'm one step ahead of you game. I don't want to be like every other bee, so I'm going to go back to my boring house to watch boring TV and look at boring pictures of myself duplicated three times on the same boring table. Oh look, it's another game where I have to move away from attacks as arrows appear on the screen. Is that feeling deja vu? Or have I eaten too many olives again? At least after this, you get to go outside and explore the park with a pollination gun, sucking up all the pollen on the flowers, spraying it all over the dying flowers, and fighting off dragonflies. There's just one problem with this, though. The game turns into Elvis Presley before he died, unable to move properly. A PS1 game of Shrek I could at least understand the choppy frame rate for, I suppose. But this? Are you telling me the Xbox 360 is struggling to run this frog and children that have been dipped in wax? This performance makes this part of the game unplayable, especially when the camera has a total mind of its own. I'm gonna move on to the next game, I think. This is Put, the 2014 hour-long free demo downloadable for your PS4 and literally nothing else, before being removed by Konami entirely just eight months later after falling out with the game's main director, Big Boss. It can't be searched, it can't be re-downloaded, and it can't even be pirated unless you count the many remakes in recent times. So I must stress, unless it's on some underground emulator that I couldn't find anything about out in time for this video, PT isn't on PC, it's on PS4. The only way you are playing this game is on a physical PS4 that just so happens to have PT downloaded onto it. This game is f scary, man, and I can't even explain exactly why it is. It's just one of the most chilling, tense, and disgusting experiences I've ever had, and I've tried to sleep with a woman. PT is a game about waking up on the floor. You see a door, walk through it, and essentially that's it. You are trapped in an endless loop of the same L-shaped corridor in a house and it's left up to you to notice what changes, how the environment reacts to you performing certain actions, and hoping that the next loop advances the story along by you doing what you think was right. Oh yeah, and you've got to do all of this while being stalked and hunted down by that. <laughs>
This ghost is Pete, named after the game, and she isn't the most aggressive enemy we've seen in any of today's games so far, but is absolutely the creepiest. You know that feeling when you're in a dimly lit house on a rainy night and you always think that this time there'll be something around the corner? Well, she is that thing around the corner, that feeling manifested. She's always there, somewhere, and if you can't see her, you'll sure as hell hear her instead. <gasps> But that's not all. You'll come across a multitude of nightmare gas, like this fetus keeling over and dying in a sink. <laughs> it kind of looks like a donkey. Then there's this festering bloody fridge hanging from the ceiling. Then there's picture frames with a million twitching eyes. And then there's a bag of shit that does nothing at first, but then eventually starts talking to you. I could do nothing but walk. Oh, the donkey baby also starts talking too, but we don't need to see any more of him. The manager liked how she looked in a skirt. What gets me, though, is how uncomfortably realistic the whole world is. It will age gradually worse as time passes, I'm sure, but for an original PS4 title nine years ago, it does not screw around with how violently real everything feels, while at the same time not feeling real even slightly. And yeah, the game's puzzles have been criticized for being way too cryptic and a little bit, well, terrible. But what's great is that even if you have a walkthrough by your side, there's so many variables at work for which scares happen at what moments that you don't actually ruin the experience. It's always unpredictable and honestly hellish. You can even trigger new scares on repeat playthroughs that you missed before in case you really love wet pants. Ah, stop it. I don't like it when you do that petite. I can't handle this man. It's so dark. I know she's there, but I don't know when she'll pop out. And the noises, please stop making the noises. There's very little rules or concrete patterns to Pete, and you'll find that multiple walkthroughs will tell you different things. It's just that kind of game, and I'm loving it, like Donald's muck. But the real tragedy of the whole thing is the fact that it was removed from retail, even though it was free, and will probably never be available in its original state ever again. And even more depressing is that the lucky few who solved all of the puzzles that involved taking 10 steps forward and then speaking through a USB microphone to a baby, then revealed that PT actually stood for playable teaser for Silent Hill. So, but now PT is gone, the project was scrapped, it'll never happen, and we got a game about a mailman instead. All thanks to the publisher Konami, who did all of this because they made the very brave choice of deciding that they didn't have enough people hating them. Oh no, they're on to me. The Konami policeman. Altogether, this makes PT feel like an ARG creepypasta about a haunted game on a haunted PS4, but actually in real life. And now that I have it forever grafted onto my PS4 and I'm never going to delete it, you know, I could sell it, but no. This is my PT machine. I own a significant piece of modern gaming history here. It's a privilege I still have it, and I'm not giving that up to anybody. This here is known as Fighters Uncaged, another game made under the Granny 3D engine. Get ready for the fight of your life, starring Miguel S. Oh, okay, no, never mind. Um, Robert I. Oh, okay, no worries, didn't need to know his. Uh, Baker T. Pis. Oh, 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 okay, oh, no, I nearly got your name there. Uh, Dimitri. Oh my god, that was on screen for less than a second. Jay, what. This game can't even get the opening credits right. I'm very excited. And you know what? To give Fighters Uncaged a little bit of praise here, I was going to contest the reviews of it at the time, like 32%, 2 out of 10, and... One, because this tutorial sequence here worked surprisingly well for me. It was able to read my types of punches decently, it got the correct kicking motions, it knew when I was dodging. I was a little perplexed at the scathing criticism at first, but then I got out of the training, looked my best friend in the eye, whose name is Spa, and all of a sudden, it all made sense. This, oh mama, 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 this is bad. Absolutely everything wrong with a shovelware connect cash grab is here and accounted for, and that's not good because this wasn't shovel. Where it was an officially developed launch title for the Kinect and given just as much marketing as Kinect Sports and Adventures. Xbox were proud of this. They were proud of this gangly brown splat. The reason the tutorial worked so well is because they were asking me to do specific moves repeatedly in a slow and spaced out fashion. But the second they expect you to perform these moves quickly on a second's notice and want you to change moves up constantly for combos and getting around blocks from the opponent, the Kinect just doesn't know what you're doing at any given time. By the time it reads you performing a punch, it's already started reading a second punch that hasn't even happened yet. And they expect you to react to your opponent when they move as fast as this. <laughs> 
Touch that. So they want you to move fast, but if you move too fast, the game does a big smelly, and they want you to quickly move back from the enemy whenever they strike. But even if you move on time, it's still too slow for the connector to even realize you moved back quickly. Fighters Uncaged is a disgrace. It looks blurrier than a painting someone just sweated on. The controls don't work. You look like an arsehole when you play it, and even the voice acting sucks. Watch out for my feet. Wow, thanks for telling me what you're about to do before you do it, Dr. Eggman. I'm sure that will help you win. I could have dodged that strike. Yes, I'm sure that's what everyone's inside voice sounds like while they're fighting to the death. Oh, gosh. I'm in a sticky situation, huh? I better shoot my gunny first or me go bye-bye. Up next, we have a very serious game called Flowers Are Dead, which also had an official PlayStation Channel trailer. The trailer is just this. What? You think I'm joking? Because I'm not. It's 60 seconds of silent and still camera shots. Sony, when you uploaded this, were you drunk? Flowers are dead, violets are blue. Give me a gun, I'm ending it. Ah, uh, great, more text. Um, a very small percentage of individuals may experience epileptic seizures or blackouts when exposed to certain light patterns or flashing lights. You know what, at this point I wouldn't be surprised if that was the story. If you thought that trailer was boring though, oh my golly gosh gosh, get ready. Because unbelievably, the trailer is a perfect representation of what the game itself is actually actually like. You thought we were moving slow in the unknown city? Nah, mate, you don't know slow. You've never seen slow. Dear Lord, who thought any of this was a good idea? This is agonizing. This isn't a video game, it's a dying man simulator. And what goes on in the head of a dying man? We're going, going to be walking walking constructed. Someone who's been simulator your guardian ever. Yes, my lumpies and germs. This is a walking simulator where you collect cassette tapes to fill in the gaps of a narrative. But whenever you collect another tape while another is still talking, you can layer them on top of each other infinitely. And this is even more disappointing for me because I love a walking sim when it's done right. But this? This is the video game equivalent of you throwing a house party and everyone talking loudly in the kitchen. Sure, it looks okay for an indie game, but god no, there's nothing to it. This might as well be an audiobook. But it isn't, so I might as well make the most of this interactivity. Let's explore a little bit. Let's go inside this house. There must be something to see here. Uh. 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 There's nothing here. Buy flowers are dead today for the low, low price of $19.99. It's cheaper than an electric chair and the torture lasts much longer. You know what? Maybe I'm just not fit enough. Which is a good thing. Because I've got Get Fit with Mel B. Yeah, yeah, yeah! Jump up, boys and girls! It's time to Get Fit with Mel B! For those of you who don't know who she is, Mel B used to be a singer with the Spice Girls, but now she's in a Kinect game where she shouts at you for being fat. You know what, though? Why not? Kinect Sports in particular made me realize that I'm not exactly in the best shape to be dealing with something like the Kinect. So it's a good thing that I've got Get Fit with Mel... B to help me out. And I do feel good about this because whoever had the game before me burned a little bit of fat on the side of the case. So what are we waiting for, lads? Let's strap on our sports shoes and spit in a bucket. Time to get the disc out then. Oh, where is it? Oh, it's there. You win this round, Mel. But when were you born? I'm tired already, can we take a break? There we go. Hello everybody, my name is Cad Icarus. I'm male, I was born on the 19th of June 1994, I'm five foot ten, and I live on a luxury yacht. However, little did I know that when I put in the disc of Get Fit With Melb, that I would be greeted with one of the most uncanny and disturbing games I've played in recent memory. The workout began, Melon looked me dead in the eye, she said, Put your right hand up now to start. And then the floodgates were opened. This is what happened when I played Get Fit with Mel B. No! Oh my god, she's cut my feet off! Mel, what have you done to me? It's my good friend, everybody, Mel B, on my, my, my luxury yacht. Mel, you change clothes! We're in the middle of the sea, where's the wardrobe? Having problems? I'm having major problems, Mel, because you've served me up on a chopping board. Am I going to be put into a steak? Bend over and uppercut. There you go. I'm now properly on your chopping board. 
It's Caddy Spit Roast. Hey Mel, do you find it a little bit funny how we're in the middle of a desert and I look a lot like Jesus? If it wants my feet in the game, then I had to be standing on top of the sofa, which means I've got to be here. I told you about barging into people's yachts and forcing them to exercise! I'm meditating! I'm floating! Mel, are you not impressed? Yeah, I disappeared! Mel, where have I gone? Hey Mel, have you met my dog? He's a big fan of the Spice Girls and he likes it when his butt gets itched on your, your luxury hot. Well, I think it's safe to say- ah! <laughs> And you know what? I honestly don't know why Mel B was needed for any of this. It didn't feel like her game at all. It could have been anybody standing there. Mel, you never told me your luxury yacht had a hidden compartment. The Michael Jackson game though? That would be his game. You can't replace MJ in that. Don't think I need to explain this, but get fit with Mel B isn't very good.